The opinions expressed on the following audio program are solely those of the host and the guests. Burner Podcast is an independently produced, not-for-profit show and is not associated with the Burning Man organization or its subsidiaries. The views expressed are not representative of the entire Burning Man community and are presented here for entertainment purposes only. In short, calm the fuck down. It's just a podcast. Episode number three. Three, tres, se, that, that's in Farsi. It's only the third one, and we've already been invited to join a terrestrial radio network. True story. The invite was actually thrown out before we even started, uh, but now that we have an actual show and it doesn't sound absolutely horrible, the invite has been enthusiastically repeated, but uh, they want us, me, to stop cursing because it's radio, and uh, I don't want to stop cursing. Uh, Why? Because fuck that, that's why. Don't censor me. I know right now my mom is listening to the show and she is going to ask me why I'm so insistent on cursing and I will not have an answer. Uh, I'll have to come up with one by the time this episode airs, which is gonna be later today, I guess. Uh, But there's just been so much attention coming our way. Uh, uh, We're flabbergasted, we are shocked, we are amazed, we are profoundly moved by how quickly so much support has been given and it's only been two episodes and I mean the first one barely sounds like the second one. Um, We're pretty settled in now, I mean the format that you're hearing is probably going to be the format that the show will be for quite some time. But uh, yeah, we're already uh, listed on BurningMan.org's community pages website. Zach, the media coordinator over at Burning Man HQ, messaged me and said that he's loving the show and uh, thank you so much for the love and support. Um, So it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that we're getting uh, all this attention and love. Um, Not gonna lie to you, I was a little worried, so was producer Meg, when we first started the show that after two or three weeks a cease and desist letter would come our way uh, because we forgot to check like some tiny mark or something somewhere, um, which is completely reasonable. I mean, uh, the, the, the brand, the name, everything has to be protected because if every John, Jane, and asshole in the rest of the world decided to just use whatever they wanted to use from Burning Man uh, to start making money or whatever the whatever it is people are doing out there that doesn't fit the 10 principles, you know, yeah, it, it has to be policed. And I do not object to that whatsoever. And, and I am psyched that they're listening to us over there at HQ. So that's, that's fucking awesome. Shout out to you guys over there. I'm going to keep cursing because fuck that. Um, There's new and exciting stuff coming our way. Uh, The network is going to be expanding, believe it or not. There's, it's already happening. There's already other people showing up uh, to our doorstep and saying, hey, can we come in? Uh, And the answer is yes. Um, So we'll be making those announcements pretty soon as well. Um, but anyway, you know, well, let's let's move on to like the my you know little opening monologue thingy. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, I commented on a post on Facebook uh, about this uh, high school football player. I don't know if you guys heard about this. Uh, this high school football player had a threesome with his teachers, uh, and we won't get into the statutory rape part of it. Yeah, I know the kid was 17. Uh, one of the teachers was like in her 20s. The other one was like early 30s. You know, I, I'm not an idiot. I, I understand that it's not a healthy situation. Uh, but I was just joking around, and I left this comment about how I've never even had a threesome, and this 17-year-old had one with his two hot teachers. And of course, the news posted photos because they were both pretty attractive i'm not gonna lie to you i mean the, the, I, I know i know i don't want to jump on that weird double standard bandwagon where it's like okay for a guy but not okay for a girl but i mean they were pretty hot and i would have been stoked if i was 17 and i had a threesome with two hot blondes um but anyway uh they, it got posted somehow of all the ridiculous brain farts that i leave on facebook this one this one particular comment happens to show up on like everybody's news feed somehow. Everyone, I don't know how that happened. The comment was uh, left on the uh, on the post of an artist friend of ours uh, in the hip hop scene, a very talented hip hop artist by the name of, uh, well, it goes by Von Po, Poetic Death. Um, he is a, a filmmaker, he's a phenomenal filmmaker. He, he makes me want to quit 
filmmaking because he's that fucking good. But anyway, I'm not going to go off on that tangent. Look up Bon Po, look up uh, uh, Organized Threat. They're pretty badass. Um, anyway, in the coming weeks, I have like five or six different burners express their shock, shock that I've never had a threesome. First of all, I'm pretty fucking flattered that this little fact seems so unbelievable to my beautiful friends. Uh, and for the record, I've been to the airport. I've just never like fully taken off. Uh, if you understand what that means, it's like smoking just like one hit of DMT and then seeing some crazy shit and then uh, not actually meeting God. So uh, I'm as flattered as I was and as flattering as it all was. And again, I can't wrap my brain around why this one comment on a post of a friend who shares exactly zero burner friends with me happened to show up on like everybody's feed. But here's the part that amuses the shit out of me. Apparently, to you dirty hippie deviants, a threesome is like the bare minimum. The outrage and shock that people expressed like, dude, seriously? Did you guys hear that Arash has never had a threesome? In Burner World, apparently threesomes are like a step below missionary. Ah, and thank you to those of you that offered to facilitate said threesome. I do appreciate it very much. I'm gonna go ahead and let that just work itself out naturally. I'm certain it's going to happen. Uh, I'm like a 40 year old virgin of the desert people. Uh, but seriously guys, come on. That's crazy that it's like the absolute bare minimum. So I love it though. It's hilarious. And it's hilarious that that subject came up in like three different parties that I went to um, completely out of the blue. Hey Ross, you never threw something? Yeah, yeah, fuck, fuck you. No, I didn't, go away. Anyway, um, on today's show, we've got Alice Wang. Alice is pretty difficult not to love. Uh, she kind of just radiates peace and warmth and all the other hippie woo-woo shit. And I'm not going to lie to you, this interview is a bit of a train wreck. You know what, train wreck? Maybe train wreck is a strong word. Um, it's a bit of a car wreck train wreck would be really bad. Um, it's a beautiful train wreck or car wreck or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I mean, you'll love every second of it. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, but this one, uh, see, Alice has that like monkey mind thing. If you're familiar with the Buddhist philosophy of the monkey mind, it's that thing that our brains do when we're just jumping from thought to thought consistent, like over and over, it's happening over and over. You're swinging from branch to branch. Um, oh, the majority of us have it. The majority of us in this community, you guys know exactly what I'm describing. Um, and uh, the whole point of mindfulness meditation practice is to ease the monkey mind, to stop your thoughts from swinging from one tree to the next. And Alice, as peaceful as she is, uh, is thinking big, big ideas nonstop, constantly. She's brilliant. She is fiercely intelligent. And that means that that damn monkey is swinging like it's being chased. I'm absolutely certain all of you are familiar with what I'm talking about. Uh, I try to keep the interview linear, but then I keep getting fascinated by where it starts going. And to add to that, we both end up getting uh, perhaps a little tipsy on the Cabernet. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of happening. We're getting drunk, trying to talk. Um, and she's fucking adorable. And the show, this show, the one that you're about to hear is going to be one of those that you'll really love if you're just craving like a late night gathering with some of your good friends. Uh, I highly suggest you drink while listening to the following interview. Since this recording, she has uh, flown back to Taiwan and back to the US again. Uh, she may have visited Zimbabwe on the way back, um, possibly a stop in Burkina Faso and Melbourne, I don't know. Hell, dear listener, you might be in Nebraska, and she might be sitting next to you as you are dearly listening to this podcast. So uh, here it is, our interview with Alice Wang, life coach, documentarian, healer, world traveler, all around awesome soul. Uh, this will be as much fun for you to listen to as it was for me to be a part of. I'm not going to lie to you. I had a really great time with it. Um, it's just, as far as like professional interview standards go, uh, you know, I'm no Walter Cartwright. Um, anyway, I go by Mr. Arash, even though nobody calls me Mr. Welcome to Burner Podcast. I was looking at all the lights There 
with plants and birds and rocks and things and the sand and hills and rain. The first thing I met was the fire from the bones and the sky with no clouds. The heat was hot and the ground was dry, but the air was full of sound. I've been through the desert on a horse with no name. It felt good to be out of the rain. In the desert, you can't remember your name. Cause there ain't no one for the kids. For a, okay. a while there, I was trying to like write my personal manifesto. Were you? Yeah. How far did you get? Um, like two pages. But that's pretty good. The point of it wasn't to like put it up on the walls and like start my own revolution. It was just so that I could like remember lessons that I've learned and have like little sayings for myself. So I should have interviewed you at um, Utopia. And yeah. you could have whipped out your manifesto and been like, "What's your revolution or revelation?" Yeah. And then you'd be like, "Well." Yeah. I whip it out randomly all the time. It's very awkward for people. But it's nice that over there it wouldn't be an issue. Because we're right. in that kind of environment. Exactly. You're free to just <laughs> reveal yourself. Your manifesto or whatever I've it is. I've heard about a few revelations yeah. on, on, on site. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah. No, wait. The last one was actually at the burn. Sorry. Mm. I keep my revelations in like my trench coat and just randomly. Show it to <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I'd written in there was... Um, uh, Plan like a German and execute like a sniper, I think. It was like something like that. And see, again, Germans like... Germans do plan for everything. Yes, they're heavy planners. Like, it was like this... Uh, I've read... I'm really big into, like, the cultural sociology, that kind of shit. And um, that's one of the things about German culture is they spend a lot of time discussing and planning things. And then once the decision is made, it is unshakable. You're not going to go back on it. And then, like, you have other cultures where it's the opposite, where they just kind of pull the trigger real quick, and then, like, last, then they change it. Like, Brazilians. <laughs> they're like, fuck it, let's do it, whatever. And then, a <laughs> minutes later, they're like, ah, let's just do something else. <laughs> so, that was, like, one of the things that I'd written hmm. in my manifesto. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So, of what you've written in your manifesto, though, is that how you feel about life? Do you, like, um, you, which... I Which feel like... playground do you find yourself playing in more? The Brazilian playground mm -hmm. or the German playground? I Even think though... I want to be more of a German. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I want to be more of a Brazilian. Um, they have, I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. They have this very just, you know, fuck it, like culture, you know, like, yeah. let's just do it. Whatever. Who cares? It'll work itself out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and so I kind of wanted that more, but I end up doing the German thing more. But, is you it know. nurturing? Is what nurturing? Is it because of a nurtured, um, you know, nature versus, versus nature? Uh, nature versus nurture. Well. Everything like, you know, it's ingrained. It's Pavlov's learned type of. Uh... It is. Um, I think, however the amount of research and discussion and Googling that I do, um, I would like to say that it comes from a place of confidence, but it's more because I totally don't trust my own decision. So I'm trying to okay. trust make, you. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to cover every single possible base before I can get there. So. I recognize yeah. that. I recognize that in the form of when I was back in corporate and with events that I would run, I was in marketing, um, and um, part of it also dipped into product management and research anyhow. And so, I would plan for. Oh God, if anything that I could think of as a risk management, like plan C D E F G H I J K, mm -hmm. I would yeah. because I would be like, I have to cover all my bases just in case something goes wrong. What was it you were doing in corporate? Uh, I was. Marketing manager. Well, the last job was marketing manager for okay. DTS. So DTS is uh, used to be called Digital Theater Systems. Mm. Did surround sound audio codec licensing to um, everybody, mm. like computers, cars, most notably like AV receivers and mm. things like that for surround sound. Yeah. Capabilities. How long um, were you there? <clears throat> about three years. So you were still like full on corporate world at that time. I was. 
And how long ago was this? 2011 was when they booted me. Okay. Finally. They yes. booted you. I was waiting to be booted. Yeah. Because it, I wasn't going to. I could have done the the ego move and been like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. This culture is not for me. Well, let's go back to it. So uh, you, you've been in the culture for a while. I mean, this wasn't. This one. Yes, okay. <laughs> in the corporate culture for a while. No, let's we're gonna we're gonna oh, go that back. One. We're gonna go that back. One. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, right now we're like at issue twelve, and we need to go back to issue one okay. to figure out how you ended up here. So you're in the corporate world. You have been for a few years. Let's sum that era up. Like, what what took you to, there to begin with? Were you at one point passionate about the corporate job, or was that Absolutely. just like it was? You're I excited was. about it. I was as a child. I yeah. wanted to. <laughs> as a child. I wanted to dress up in suits every mm-hmm. day and have that corner office yeah. with the windows and be able to stand out the window and mm-hmm. look out. Where where did that... I had um, that image in my mind. Yeah, where mind. did that image get implanted? It's a good question. I wonder. Because I can tell you, I had it too. And I had it for my brother. Because my, my big brother was like the coolest fucking person in the world. And I would see him coming and going to work in suits. And I'm like, mm. I want to do that. It wasn't my family. Mm. Not in suits. No. I think it might have been... I feel like it was must have been a movie or something. For some reason, I felt like that's what I wanted. Or it mm-hmm. could have also been The Fountainhead. The Fountainhead. Ayn Rand. Oh, okay. Oh, Ooh, okay. I know, right? It's the strangest <laughs> thing in yeah. the world, but I don't know why that could have been. Um, just threw up in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> I'm not judging you. I just thought it would be a funny thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> right mm-hmm. and, and with the fountainhead it was really the descriptions of the architecture mm. that i was really enamored with yeah. and it's just like and part of that i don't even know how that is relevant to being in suits in a high towered building corner office would make sense but it did well so it, translate it a, a, a strong artist creates a culture they let you smell things with an image. They let you taste things with a sound. So good point. She she was there. I mean, there's no doubt that she was a powerful artist and had powerful ideas. Right. So um, whether and, or not you agree with them, it currently is a whole different discussion. Right. That's yeah. a whole other discussion. Yeah. That was back in my days of selflessness. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should take take that back. But anyways, <laughs> no, so, actually no. So. Uh, continue let's see so you're in corporate world you you grow up you follow that dream i did and Um, i got to travel the world i think in um, high school i really wanted to travel the world i could remember in humanities class Mm. um we yeah i would just flip through the pages i would kind of just peruse i really didn't quite read through everything that we're supposed to yeah it still worked out it was easy yeah classes were easy and um Looking at all the pictures of the places, whether it's the Colosseum or if it's the Arc de Triomphe for, um, you know, I don't think we studied, I don't think we studied the Great Arc, uh, the Great Wall. But in any case, all of these pictures of places, I was like, I want to go to these places. Yeah. And lo and behold, I think that I've been able to manifest that. I didn't realize that until the last few or several years. Mm-hmm. Still in the corporate world. No, I don't. Okay, I, I now didn't. We're, we're skipping forward. Let me let me take you back. I want to stay in the corporate world Thanks. era for a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, you're you're just doing, by the way, that thing that high intellect people do, which is you're making like connections really fast that the listener might not be able to keep up with. Oh, good not point. because the listener is not of high intellect, but just because yeah. we need to convey the information in a linear fashion in order for there to be a story. Thank you. Actually, this was mm-hmm. part of my situation <laughs> back in corporate because. Yes. Um, bouncing from idea to idea to idea right the monkey mind exactly it's the monkey mind or uh in meetings Mm. departmental meetings where a situation is presented by the rvp for instance and then okay go Mm. and immediately have the resolution i have a solution for it okay so x y and z this these are the avenues that we could take Mm -hmm. to be able to solve the situation um and then for me it was like simple yeah it already saw the end yeah but by presenting it at such and it was repeatedly that they it, I just see you in the headlights mm-hmm. right yeah and then i'm like 
Because there are powerful ideas, and then there are powerful ways to communicate said ideas. And, right, and mm. I wasn't communicating the way that they were able to really digest them. Mm -hmm. And so I used to get frustrated because then I would just sit there because it's like, okay, obviously my ideas suck or mm -hmm. they they don't make sense. Yeah. An hour would go by. At the very end of that hour, then my boss would come up and start talking about, oh, it's like an algebraic equation. This to this to that yeah. to this. And then c concluding at um, some of the, um, the same results. Well, actually, usually concluding at the ideas that I presented it mm -hmm. five minutes into the meeting. Yeah, yeah. I get frustrated. I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't I just say that it's, five minutes ago? Yeah, it's, um, that's interesting. It's, uh, it's kind of like this thing that I've always spent time analyzing. Um, the, the dance of intelligence versus wisdom. You know, like you, we have psychologists today and sociologists and we have our education and we, we go through the ringer, like understanding a certain thing about human behavior and then we look at our parents generation and they just like didn't have any of that and yet they figured these things out from a whole different angle mm. you know like um like we might have uh you know a, a 500 page analysis of why this particular candidate is not going to be able to win district seven and district eight and three um and then like your grandfather would be like oh yeah uh, ears too big you know people with ears too big don't win elections <laughs> And they're like totally right. <laughs> so you're kind of experiencing some of that in the mm, corporate world. Yes, absolutely. It was. So let me let me go back to that. So at one point you said that you got to travel a lot. That was thanks to the corporate world still? Yes, it was actually. Yeah. I was able to acquire jobs almost directly right out of college. Um, Were you a marketing major? No. What was it? I entered as a business mm -hmm. and I exited as a liberal studies major okay. with a major emphasis in English and a minor emphasis in business administration. So when we're talking mark corporate, I'm sorry, corporate world, what is it exactly you were doing? So uh, when I first got in sales mm -hmm. for electronics manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, during college, I had some uh, various jobs. I worked in uh distribution or wholesale and distribution of electronic components mm. uh like you know pc boards things like that uh networking cards and as well as uh working for restaurants yeah they serve food right yeah. i get meals served um mm -hmm. <laughs> um so after college i got a sales job in manufacturing and it was for a taiwan office or Taiwan Corporation, and I represented them here, but also had the opportunity to actually visit uh, Germany, for instance, CBIT, yeah. uh, CES here, uh, Computex in Taiwan, um, and then also the opportunity to hop around in Europe a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, it sounds like you're you're fucking loving it at this point. At that point, I was. Yeah. It was it was a sweet gig. Yeah. Was, actually, in hindsight, it was like, that was a really sweet gig. So where did the descent begin? The descent? It yeah. wasn't even that. That was great. And then I won a challenge. Mm -hmm. It was boring because I wasn't really... I didn't feel like I was actually uh, achieving anything mm -hmm. with the that particular sales job. So I hopped from sales job to sales job or sales to marketing because I was interested in marketing mm -hmm. and being able to... It's a little um, more creative. Yeah, more yeah. creative. I really wanted to reach out to creative elements. Um, yeah, I worked for um, Acer. Mm -hmm. uh, the, com the computer everybody right. buys on clearance. Ex <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and before, they were actually two different companies, Acer Computers and Acer uh, Multimedia. Mm -hmm. And so I was with the Multimedia branch, and they're the branch that actually, uh, or the segment uh, that actually was making money versus Apple, I'm um, sorry, Acer computers at the time. Mm -hmm. And then they were going through a branding change because of that to turn into BenQ. BenQ? Yeah, BenQ. Okay. And so I was doing, I was out in England to work with mm -hmm. that branch. So That's I want to, let, let's, let's skip ahead. You said that you wanted to get booted. Oh, okay. Jumping forward. Jumping forward several years, jobs. years, years later. Mm -hmm. right. Um, 
Are we being recorded? We are. <laughs> yeah. You can you can cover up, you know, certain details and names. Cool. Because nobody knows or gives a shit. Like, we just want right. to hear the general story of your oh, God. Okay. journey, not so much the individual contractual details. Great. Good. Um, I wanted to get booted. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do at that particular time and place anymore. Mm-hmm. I knew that I wasn't happy. I knew that... I was in a culture that uh, was not suitable for me. What about it? I normally, I can only describe it as being toxic. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the environment that I felt like I wanted to thrive in. Was it that particular company or was this a general feeling that was building up in you over the years of working corporate? I would have to say it's probably that particular company. Mm-hmm. Um, it, at that time, it was because I've had other jobs where I had amazing connections with people that I worked with. Not to say I didn't have those that with the people at this company, sure. But as a whole, um, I think that there's a sense of family when we have when we feel like we're in a tribe when we're. Mm-hmm. Um, no, we're aware. Wanted when we're, we're accepted as who and what we are. Sure. And then we're able to be free to be who we are and expand. Mm-hmm. And then there are other uh, situations or communities or places where we get into where it's just not the right fit. Okay. So, but at the same time, I think that was also my sense of. Perhaps the industry as a whole. Mm-hmm. And then, so was there a moment that you, for lack of a better description, uh, subconsciously or consciously concocted the idea of getting booted? I think I subconsciously concocted it first. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely uh, searched for jobs at the time to, as a way to explore other potentials yeah yeah it's kind of like doing a lot more window shopping when you feel a relationship coming to an end right yeah (laughs) Yeah. there you go i was window shopping but then you know when you like like new relationships um let's just say your your relationship is coming to an end and then you meet someone new Mm um if you let that somebody know that hey, well, this is ending. An inevitable question might be, well, why, or yeah. why would you want to? Why would you be interested in me or yeah. whatnot? And I got stuck with that question. Mm-hmm. I answered it. I didn't believe my own answer. Yeah. Um, it reminded me back of a time when I used to lead church youth groups. Way, way, way yeah. back. In a previous life. <laughs> In a previous life, yeah. And I remember right before I left church, uh, I'm up there leading. I remember uh, leading prayer. Mm-hmm. And I had to, because I'm leading prayer, I'm saying certain things that I should feel passionate about and I believe. And I felt myself lying. Yeah. I felt myself being insincere and um, inauthentic. Yeah. And that just felt wrong. And I was just like, you could feel, I could feel it within my whole body going, uh, yeah. oh, I can't do this. Yeah. So what happened that you got booted? What happened after? Yeah. It? No, what happened when you got booted? What, what got you booted? Uh, I'm not sure if I could speak to all of this. Okay. Technically. Okay. We'll skip ahead. So you got booted. Right. You but, wanted to. Right. But actually, I can't. Actually, I should be able to. Basically, um, annual review. Mm-hmm. So it's and just a performance issue. They said it was a performance issue. Yeah. I asked for records, and they did not pr- provide any. Mm-hmm. Okay. Of performance I- issues. Okay. 
but it was a great opportunity for me to just accept it as is. I got the answer that I needed. Mm -hmm. And essentially, it's just it wasn't the right fit for whatever reason. Yeah. When you're done, you're done. Yeah. Like, it doesn't really matter anymore. It doesn't really matter. I It mattered for me in the moment, at the moment, but then in hindsight, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, so you're out of there. You're out of the corporate world. You I have... got what I needed. Yeah. And which was, it wasn't, there's was no, there wasn't really a need at the time for, hey, job well done or anything anymore. Mm -hmm. You didn't need validation anymore. Right. Okay. And during my stint, I felt like I needed validation. Yeah. And I kept striving, kept trying to prove myself, working around the clock, you mm -hmm. know, 20 hour days, you know, were the norm. And so it was just like release, relief. Mm -hmm. So this is this is 2011, is that correct? This is, uh, it ended 2011. Okay. So end of 2011, um, you're out on your ass. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming you That's have great. some time to reflect. I mean, what, what was your plan for the next step? What did you want to do? Actually, my head had already planned. I already planned to downsize. Worst case scenario, downsize everything. Um, I did have, can I say it, shitload? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been saying fuck over and over, so I'm pretty oh, sure yeah? you say shitload, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I've um, I had a shitload of debt, nine credit cards. Mm -hmm. And that was partly what kept me in the corporate game, too, because it's like, well, I need to pay for these cards. How am mm -hmm. I going to pay for these cards? And how am I going to upkeep my image or my status? And um, and finally, actually, a friend of mine, I have to credit Nancy for really um, asking me the questions of what's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. Really? What is the worst thing? Okay. Uh, I have to downsize. Worst thing is I have to move back home to my dad's. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. And I want to, I want to, I want to explore this for a second here. So you're, you're talking about downsizing, um, but you were saying that you were pretty happy in the corporate environment. Um, but now you're talking about detaching from things. So, I mean, at some point, either this idea had always existed or it got sparked that life is not so much about things and possessions and status. The way you speak on it now, mm -hmm. uh, I imagine, was not the same way you were speaking on it back then. Was there yeah. something that happened that sparked this idea that you wanted to downsize, that you wanted to start detaching from things and exploring your own path? Hmm. Um I actually feel as though it's more of a returning to the path mm -hmm. as opposed to detaching, right? Sure. I think that as a child, this goes way back. As a child, I used to sit in my room and wonder, what is my purpose in life? And this is probably, I don't know, third grade, fourth grade, yeah. fifth grade, yeah. sixth grade, that sort of thing. Um, and just sitting there really pondering what really is the purpose and I think that's why with Ayn Rand, with Fountainhead, the idea of selflessness came in, the church mm -hmm. came in with, you know, just being able to uh, give oneself. And I bought wholeheartedly into that before. Yeah. But then even sprouting from that, that allowed, as a child, it allowed me to explore what are the potentials of, if I had a dream, if I had an idea, what if I just went ahead and did something about it versus just sitting around mm -hmm. thinking and dreaming about this idea or asking for approval? Um, because there was a time when I asked for approval for things um, such as occupational things as a young child, mm -hmm. and they were denied yeah. for whatever reasons. So you had you had the path as a child, and then right. somewhere along the line, uh, like a Christmas tree, all of a sudden this stuff starts getting hung on you. You're like, all right, you got to get the nice job, you got to get the yes. credit cards, uh, the yes. status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now you're back to you've gotten to a place in your life around 2011 where you're like, okay, I need to return to my path. I'm not sure what it is, but I just know all this other stuff is holding me back. Maybe walk away from it and figure out what this path is and what the idea is that I want to execute. So you get was, away from the credit cards. Right. It was more of, uh, uh, yes, it was exploration. Mm -hmm. It was more of rediscovery of the self. Okay. Finally hitting that wall of rediscovery. And 
Um, what did you start to explore at this time? I mean, I'm, it seems like you had like some time to just explore, right? You had money like already coming in from, I don't know, unemployment or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, uh, I'll move back briefly on this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I planned out that there would be unemployment. Mm -hmm. I had stocks. I still had cash. Nice. Yes, I still had um, that shitload of debt, mm -hmm. right? That I was still slow, slowly paying off. But, um, was it really nine credit cards? Yeah. What do you need nine credit cards for? To offset one with the other. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at one point, it really was, right? I mean, yeah. I meet people like that, and I'm like, I have no idea. I have one debit card. It's the type of thing. <laughs> back then, yeah. I, I have one debit card right now. Yeah. Um, but uh, back then, it was, uh, oh, look. I bought, I charged up all this stuff. I wasn't able to pay off completely. Yeah. Oh, look, another card offers you 4.9% yeah. <laughs> or something, right? You transfer over. Um, and like an idiot at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That needed the lesson to be learned. I transferred, not really reading or perhaps not even paying attention to the fine detail. The fine detail meaning to keep track of my finances. I wasn't keeping track of my own finances. I yeah. Was I was more concerned with trying to prove myself, yeah. prove my worthiness. Because each credit card work. was validation. Well, no, no, it wasn't. Mm. Actually, it wasn't the credit cards. It was, that was something that I kept like on the back burner. That yeah. was my own little secret detail type of thing. And then it was more of keeping, I think it was more keeping this facade of an image out here. Yeah. Um, whenever friends who are out of work, uh, were around, I would treat them. Yeah. I would treat myself. I would like to... Pop uh, in bottles. No, not, <laughs> it's actually not, not so much that. A little yeah. bit, but not that much. Mm. More so <laughs> eating out. Yes. <laughs> eating at uh, restaurants and whatnot. And so... The credit card thing cracks me up because I... Like, I see people that have that, like the nine credit cards, and then, like, they've explained to me the importance of having nine and how easily you can get, like, robbed blind if you only have one or some shit. I don't know. There's a bunch of details they've explained to me, and I don't understand it. Um, but my one debit card has been really great. <laughs> my bank calls me if there's ever fraud issues. Nice. Maybe I'm just too broke for that to be, like, a real issue. Maybe if you make a lot more money, the nine credit cards are helpful. <laughs> but, but... Okay, I mean, I made good money back then. Um, I, I was able to... Well, okay. Clarification. Mm. That first job right out of college, it was uh, it was great. Um, they paid me. They reimbursed me for expenses, but I would have to expense first. Yeah. So, and oftentimes they didn't come back for a couple of months. Uh, so again, so that's yes. already on my charge before I actually get paid, before yeah. I get reimbursed. Yeah. That kept rolling. I didn't pay attention to that. Yeah. I wasn't because of my not paying attention to my own finances. I incurred all of the charges. I incurred all mm. of the debts. Um, and I didn't, part of it was not asking up front for what would help me to, what would help to ease my financial yeah. burden. How did you pay off the credit cards? I ended up settling um, offering settlements mm -hmm. and also paying them off. Yeah. And so... How long did that take? I finished paying off the last of the nine March this year. Oh, nice. Hey, Yay, cheers. Cheers. That's, cheers. The, yeah, that's the sound of wine glasses. <laughs> mm. Mm. Eye contact is very important when you cheers. Yes. You did it. No, we're, I mean, did we're I fine. Forget? Yeah, no, I was just, trying uh, to. I was more concerned about not cracking yeah. the... No, we're, I mean, yeah, it would spill all over the microphone. And your funny. nice sofa here. Yeah, so. and my amazing... Your amazing sofa Your amazing here. expensive sofa. Yes. Uh, what is it? My, my sister-in-law is from Austria. She's saying that if you don't make eye contact and cheers and not drink, uh, it's seven years bad sex. So... Is that the only one with the seven years of bad sex? Well, I mean, I know it's no, a seven years bad that. luck with mirrors. So when she told me that, I started to wonder if some guy had told her that. Nobody wants bad sex. No, no. 
I mean, oh, people like deeply look into each other's eyes whenever I tell them that. <laughs> I mean, but then again, like, do you finish having sex every time and you're like, wait, was that bad? I don't know. That was pretty good. Maybe I did make eye contact and I didn't realize that I did. You mean you don't? Making eye contact or having bad sex? No, I was talking about pondering. Was that good sex? Oh, uh, I've had that a couple of times. <laughs> I'm like I don't know I don't know how that went. So I was like, was that good? I think it was good. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, <fuck. laughs> do I, do I feel like having a cigarette. Wait, no, I would anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but uh, so okay, credit cards are paid off. Credit cards are paid off. But yes. okay, but but you haven't you started the things that you're working on today still during this era. This was it still 2011. Were you still exploring? When did your ideas start to come about for the... I want to get into the, the stuff you're doing now, the documentary. The stuff I'm yeah. going, doing now. Okay, so 2011, I decided this is my time, yay, mm. to discover more about myself. Um, and to really d- discover what it is that I really wanted to do. Um, How did you do that exploration? It went through, it was actually a couple, multiple things <clears throat> through relationship, through uh, my mother had decided to take on a, get into the dry cleaning business mm. that year. So I just happened to fall into it and went to help out. Helping out meant from three days, it turned into a full-time job. Yeah. And then I was miserable again because I didn't have time to myself that I thought I, that I was sectoring out. Yeah. And that was a huge realization of how easily I could just fall right back into that scope of, oh, um, just going with the flow, right? And the flow of life, the flow of uh, opportunities versus really targeting and figuring out what it is that I want, that I feel passionate about again. Mm-hmm. Um, now I like the term being the flow when I am the flow mm. then I get to flow along with other people and other things that are in the flow yeah I'm not following him or uh, I'm not following the flow anymore it's it's you definitely don't want to yeah I, I would agree that following the flow is uh uh not particularly great for one's personal growth um there is a discussion that I have often with myself about finding that nice sweet spot between being fluid uh flowing yourself but then also being a stone and being rock mm. hard enough for people to be able to cling on to you and hold on to you as a leader that's a good point actually that's mm. a very very good point i mean especially i think for me um uh, as a man i've had to find that balancing act because you do want to be fluid in order to connect with what's happening and not be so strict that you're stuck on your old ways but uh, generally speaking, and all the hippies listening to this are, are going to want to correct this. Generally speaking, the masculine energy is that it's most attractive and effective when it's very like like a stone. Like I am, I am a rock. You can hold on to me when the rushing waters are pounding against us. So, but it's a weird balancing act. It is kind of really, doing that every day. It's a very interesting way that you're putting it because I've actually not thought about that before. Perhaps from a feminine perspective, uh, or maybe just speaking from my own experience, that, that I sense this perception of women being fluid, mm-hmm. right, versus that stone, and just being very, uh, yeah, it's the word I'm looking for. I think fluid is the word. Fluid is the word. <laughs> <laughs> I think fluid is the word. One more glass of this and then... Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> of, our, of, our, of our sponsors, Charles Shaw of Trader Joe's, of course. None, none but Thank the finest you. for my guests. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> right, 99 cent store uh, wine glasses. Yes. Perfect. Mm. So so you're, you're at this time, you're explaining yourself. You said part of the relationship, you're in the dry cleaning business and you're you're feeling yourself getting sucked back into following the flow rather than being the flow yourself what, Absolutely. what what snap what snaps you out of it uh realistically just uh a disagreement between my mother and i 
yeah. about how the business should be run yeah uh, from a daily perspective or over a long term so and it was perfect mm-hmm. it was the perfect thing to uh part ways and i believe wholeheartedly in relationships whether it is uh romantic business or otherwise that there comes a time when two people need to grow apart as individuals let me i want to ask you about that do you think that that was the fact that it's your mom and you love her and you respect her and you still had this clash do you think that was a major determining factor in jarring you back into your path and and kind of realizing oh wait like i i don't hate this person as an individual i just disagree with them so i need to find my way uh it wasn't the it wasn't hate at all it was of course really, not yeah right. that's my mom it was a uh, um because let me tell you why I'm asking. Because um, okay. I had a very similar experience recently um, in in a professional situation where I had sort of gotten to a place where I was like ready to move on from this professional arrangement that I'm a part of. And some things ended up changing and a new person comes in uh, who I get along with amazingly and I make really good friends with and then we still clash. And that was the moment that I realized like, oh, it's not the person that I have an issue with. It's this arrangement. And I've noticed quite a few times that when people sort of get, you know, they jar out of following the flow, as you were describing, a lot of times that epiphany moment is when they have that clash with somebody that they do care about as an individual. And they're like, oh, it's not that person. It's not that like my boss is a dick. Like eventually it just turns out like maybe he was a cool guy, but he's part of that organism and you're just no longer a part of that organism. You know, and, and you had that aha moment with your mom because, you know, it's your mom, you love her. Of course. And you still disagreed. So you're like, okay, well, obviously it's the system. It's not the individuals in the system. I agree. Uh, mm-hmm. It's the system. It's the system of um, how two individuals mm-hmm. uh, see fit. It's, I don't know, I'm trying to find the words to this. When two people aren't able to see eye to eye on how a system should be run. Mm. Okay. And obviously it was her, her organization. And so it is absolutely my turn to go ahead and step out of that organization and figure out where I fit in best. Yeah. Um, that was more of a temporary position that I knew at the get go. That was just to get it ramped up. Yeah. There was no, never, um, there was never a thought within me that I would stay with that organization long term anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was the perfect time to part ways. It was ramped up. It was going. Mm -hmm. Things were running. Now it's time for me to actually finally find my own path, discover what was right for me. So what do you do next? Uh, what happens next? Well... Um, I had a breakup in February, Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012 that allowed me to launch into, uh, a coaching weekend. A friend of mine who was becoming a coach at the time, uh, had asked me if I wanted to join, uh, and Uh, elaborate on coaching because I have a friend who's offered me, um, I'm not going to say who because then I don't want people to start contacting this person for free coaching. <laughs> but uh, um, <laughs> she has offered me uh, uh, some coaching sessions because she's a certified coach. And I, I really, I can't really, I'm a little confused because I've heard life coach. I've heard financial coach. What is it? What does it mean when people say just coaching? I think that people have different uh, terminologies or uh there are different ways to coaching and there are different types of coaches. Some coaches call themselves coaches when they are mentors, mm-hmm. right? When they tell you what do you, they advise you on what you should, shouldn't do. Do you pay this person? Uh, you can. Yes. Okay. So I feel or like a mentor would be mentoring you as a. Right. Normally it's yeah. kind of here. This is, a, it's more of a gifting. Yeah. I know, believe on, in you. You're yes, my, right. my uh, disciple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes people do charge okay for that coaches do coaches do and mentors sometimes do too mm-hmm. depending on how they are viewing that particular type of relationship yeah. and mentoring is really just a form of uh a description of them 
mentor sh- of that relationship. Um, so this coaching thing that you got into, like what would, what is it? Life coaching? Like what coaching of what? It's life coaching. It's considered life coaching. Um, I got into, uh, the Institute of Professional Excellence in Coaching. Mm-hmm. It's a, a program that's all over the U.S. Uh, they are actually expanding outside of the U.S. presently with uh, translated uh, materials, educational materials into Chinese, yeah. I think Spanish and maybe French, or or it might be German. Like, so but, your, um, your, your friend that invites you for this weekend, yes. she is a coach? Uh, she wasn't at the time, and she mm-hmm. was going into this coaching uh, seminar already, mm-hmm. and she was starting her course uh realistically i thought i was going to be that problem child Mm. the one that's trying to figure things out uh the one who just broke up Mm -hmm. right and um, is that a specific archetype i I was not aware no it wasn't it was just (laughs) i just thought i was the problem child i thought it was bring a problem child to class type Mm -hmm. of thing you know (laughs) problem child for the coach like they wouldn't be able to figure you out yeah kind of that sort of thing like you know every coach bring a problem child so that you could work on them that was my you know notion because i didn't have no idea what a coach was yeah i'd seen it out and about but i was just like i don't know what a coach is what made you want to say yes to the seminar uh i read up a little bit of what she sent me and i thought well Fuck it. Yeah, fuck it. Let me go check it out. You know, I mean, what have I got to lose? Um, I could either... They have orange juice in the morning. Yeah. They... Did I? They did serve... They did serve... They serve stuff. uh, Continental (laughs) breakfast. I think so. (laughs) Sounds so fancy, but it's like usually just a roll. A A roll, a few rolls. Burnt coffee. And some OJ, maybe. Maybe. Um, But, I don't know, did they serve... I can't remember. Anyways, I didn't go for the food. I went for what I thought was therapy. Mm-hmm. because I was at a point where it's kind of like, wow, I'm really having a difficult time with this uh, breakup. I mm-hmm. uh, thought we were going to potentially get married, things like that. How long were you together? <laughs> <laughs> you know that was going to be the question. It's, it was a really intense one year. Okay. okay. Ah, that's... Super intense. That's but, okay. But, mm. and you, who, who, um, so... I decided, well, I could go and pay for therapy. Mm-hmm. Or I could get to check out this coaching thing. Yeah. Great. I had to be committed for three full days. Not like I was really doing anything at the time, right? Perfect. I don't um, have a job. I don't have a boyfriend. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I get in. And uh, it was an amazing weekend. Uh not only were we coached, everybody was coached and everybody got an opportunity to coach. Mm. So from that, it was um, practicing. It was was also kind of like practicing what we preach, essentially. And I got to meet so many people. I got to practice the art of coaching. And I realized something that felt really familiar. Um, The way that coaching went about, sure, there were certain techniques that we were learning, but part of it was what I think that I did intrinsically that mm-hmm. I've always done. And part of that perhaps lends to just listening intensely. I'm less, I'm actually not really familiar with being interviewed. I'm more familiar with asking questions. Yes. I know. We, we started this interview with you asking questions. Ah, oh, God. And then I flipped you around. You did. You did. And then you were like... Hey. Yeah. Like, I'm in charge here. I noticed. Yes. You took the reins. Because <laughs> I am man. <laughs> <laughs> Beating chest. Yeah. And I am woman. Yeah. I have my ways. I, you know, I actually... <laughs> I, we don't actually even have a podcast. This whole thing is a sham just to get girls in my apartment. I think so. We are not recording... This thing, obviously, no. this very phallic-looking thing is not a microphone. It is a very phallic-looking thing. It's <laughs> it is a very like, phallic what? microphone. How many inches is that? It's, uh, it's you know, it's got This some... is at least, like, five, six inches lengthwise. Mm. Growth is, like, two, three that inches. That was impressive growth. measurement that you just did with your hand completely out of nowhere. That's called a span. Is that what it is? Yeah. How do you know? How do you have this information? School. Oh, I didn't. I, I went to San Diego State. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, talking about elementary school. <laughs> yeah, that's where I went to San Diego State. Wait, I almost went to San Diego State until oh, my dad found out that it that was a party school. Oh yeah, you where did you go? 
you see Riverside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah your your yeah. dad. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I don't thing. know how much how much better that was, but um, I didn't know <laughs> shit in school. I really didn't. I wanted to get the fuck out. Yeah. Because I was not being challenged. I was like, you know what? I'm bored. Yeah. I'm really, really bored. Yeah. But I need a degree. Yeah, yeah. No. I know that was that was the whole reason I was at San Diego State because I already right. put in all the um the units the, and the blah yeah, blah blah. Yeah. That's part of the reason why I stayed at UC Riverside mm. and I actually kinda of wanted to go to USC. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a little cliche. It is cliche. You're... I had no money to go to USC, yeah. but I actually would have rather gone to USC because of just um, the breadth of availabilities and information and accessibilities mm -hmm. to opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a program out there, a summer academy program that I accepted, got accepted to during high school. Yeah. So I was able to meander about the campus and be like, oh, oh interesting. Yeah. Sketchy, but interesting. USC sketchy? Uh, um, right along the borders. Oh, I don't remember it being sketchy. I do remember feeling like I was at UCSD. And then later, having read that, like, the UC schools are pretty much all predominantly Asian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's, like, a thing, apparently. Uh, it's apparently a thing, yeah. right? I was just trying to get as far away from my parents as possible. Mm. I lived in LA. Riverside is about as far as you can go. <laughs> as as far as I was allowed yeah. to go. Yeah. I wanted to apply to NYU. Not that I don't know if I would have gotten in, but I did have a great glorifying um, letter of recommendation that I never sent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, things like that made me really um, ponder uh, what are some of the opportunities that I gave up because I doubted myself because... I didn't find myself worthy um, or that I didn't think that I had enough or I didn't have the balls to just try. The lady balls. The lady yeah. balls. My, uh, my dear, you are in very good company. I imagine everybody you tell that story to would generally, I mean, it's very rare that you'll talk to somebody that would say like, oh yeah, took full advantage of every opportunity. <laughs> my life's been awesome. Got even like the wealthiest people I meet can't yeah. wait to tell you about how hard it was hmm. and it continues to be really that is one thing that we have in common i think like it's very rare for people to just like say i mean i for, i can tell you this my my experience was almost the opposite about what we're describing here specifically about how we describe it mm -hmm. like one thing was like i did not take credit for anything i did um, why i don't know where that came from but like for example i'm very tall for anybody who might How be listening to this, I'm six four ish. Wow. Five ish. You are? Let's see. Um, yeah. you, you stood next to me like a hundred times. Yeah, well, I, no, not a hundred times. Now you have shoes. Now you no, have I have shoes. no shoes. You have no shoes. Oh, you are. Yeah. You are tall. kind of tall. Yeah, um, you are pretty tall. All right, let's Agreed. get Agreed. back here. Um, Thank you. You're very tall. I am pretty tall. And so one of the things that I would do tall. is that whenever, <laughs> like, whenever I would uh, have something. Like okay, we do just we just know that statistically, for example, taller people tend to get jobs easier. Notice like doors easier. open. Yeah, doors do open because doors they open. have to open. For you. Yes, well, <laughs> and like what happened is that every time I would have something open for me, my first thought was like, oh yeah, see, I mean, I only got that because of this thing that I have no control over, so I didn't do anything special to earn it. Well, what else do you have that uh, you felt wasn't special that you had? It was like a common, or that was special that you felt you had. Okay, well, I mean, like, for example, I I have been an, an artist since I was a child. You're pretty much born an artist. Um, and I was drawing, I think, like, in middle school. And there would be... I knew this other kid who was an amazing illustrator. I mean, he was doing professional-level work in sixth grade. And my drawing was just, just a hacky. Like, it was bullshit. I drew, like, a, you know, the bulldog from looney tunes and it was like totally almost copied wow. <laughs> you know and but then i would get like all this credit for it and then they put it on like our team t-shirt and like every time people needed drawings they'd run to me and ask me and the other kid of course like he hated me he looked for any excuse to like attack me like to talk shit about my art and i don't blame him because he was really fucking good and so I felt like the sham thing. Like, I'm like, I'm totally a sham. And the reason that I'm getting the attention is just because, like, I'm nicer than he is. 
and I would welcome people to come and ask me to like draw things for them rather than just being so fucking good that people were like, I must have your illustration on my notebook, you know? And um, I guess looking back now, part of the lesson that I've learned that I'm curious if you've learned as well is that your personality and how you network with people is a huge factor in getting your art noticed. And you're always going to meet people who will be better than you. Always. Like that never, ever stops. But if you have other talents, such as socializing, and maybe just you're, you're very sincere and you're open and you're connecting with people and you're making friends. And uh, some more bitter people will say, you know, that old saying they have, um, uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. I That is true. Mm -hmm. But if who you know opens a door for you, you better be fucking ready to walk through it. Good point. Because you could go out and tell everybody you're an amazing photographer, for example. And then somebody says, hey, we need an amazing photographer to come shoot this billboard. And then you show up and you can't perform. Then you're a sham. But you got to know the right people. But you also got to be ready when the, when the opportunity does present itself. It's the preparation versus... Uh, I'm Preparation meets yeah, opportunity. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Somebody said that uh, you're doing quotes right. yeah, for the I'm listeners. Doing uh, it's what is it? Uh, opportunity. It's like that old saying. Somebody did a twist on it though. Like opportunity is not is for the well prepared. I don't know. Who knows? We'll think about it later. Well, we've been drinking a lot of wine. It. Is what has happened. <laughs> or maybe not enough. Yeah, or not enough. Uh, I will grab the wine. <laughs> I'm Tell, just kidding. No, 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 no. You're you're getting a refill. So, um, but go back to that though. So the coaching weekend continue to yes. so it, it's amazing you have big epiphanies um what is the big thing that you got out of it that moved you to the next step in the journey well as you are uh liquoring me up here uh thank you very much it's the epiphany was that this comes so naturally to me coaching i like the sound of that i wonder if the mic got it i wonder you want to do it again over here? Oh, here. Let me see. Yes. Do it closer. Okay. So you that they could that. tell that it's a hefty pour. Yes. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, it's it's $3 wine, so we're going to fucking drink it. <laughs> it's a fucking hefty pour. <laughs> I think it's over. Right. Cheers. Here. Salute. Salute. All right. So, coaching, it comes oh. very naturally to you. Coaching. Um, the techniques that they were teaching, or at least the, um, these were just some basic techniques that they were teaching. I partially was really listening and um, the responses that I got from the people who were actually there to be coaches. I mean, there were only, I think maybe a few of us, a hand, maybe a handful of us who were invited or whatnot, but everyone else who were there specifically to be coaches who researched the hell out of all these other schools mm -hmm. were like, this is the one that, felt most right to me right? that's interesting exactly they're that's... referring to you 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 felt the most like a genuine coach. no no no. they were talking about the school oh okay okay <laughs> i'm sorry itself yeah. right um and then so but there were these people who had been uh, earnestly searching some of them had were were just amazed by wow how did you know how did you get this out of me i'm surprised i talked about this or mm. things like that and um Based off of that, I was just, I was also surprised that, wait a minute, I was just, as long as I just settled within myself mm -hmm. and took things at my own pace versus what I used to do in corporate, which was trying to go at the pace of someone else. Yeah. Trying to match someone else. If somebody asked me, I need this now. Oh, yes. I'll, yes, I'm super impacted. I'm going to fulfill your request. Mm-hmm. This was different. This was just sitting and really listening and asking the pertinent questions that were begging to be asked. And it was when I really was able to tap into my intuition mm -hmm. and just allow the questions to come forth and not censor myself with, oh, is this the right question to ask? Should I be asking this? Yeah. Is this proper or improper for this person? Uh, 
So just being myself really was what it was. Mm. That was the, that, the light bulb that went off and was just like, wow, I, I need to come back to this. How did, how if did, not to learn more about myself, yeah, then for this profession. But most importantly, first and foremost, I got into the program because it was for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then how does that connect to your current project? Which my current project, which is which yeah. is the, the 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 big thing that sort of it all, all the story leads to is the mm. climax of the story. Dun dun dun! Yeah. <laughs> Dream shift. Just dramatic inspired. music. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that. How did that? How did that start? It started because um, I had started coaching, so my program was um, going forward, and I realized at one point and I was coaching some people and it was a succession of event, of events actually mm -hmm. that allowed me to realize that I wasn't walking the talk fully as a coach mm -hmm. because my focus was on life purpose and life planning redirectional transitions yeah. and uh, that was also partly of where I was and I realized oh wow wait I'm actually still in that transition mm -hmm. So in order to fully engage and fully be present to be a coach, I have to also transcend myself. Yeah. Life is always about transcending, right? We're always... We're always moving, moving. in a direction. Exactly. Uh, that's definitely one thing I've noticed. Everyone is always moving in a direction. You're either moving towards a more fear-based and closed-off direction, or you're moving towards a positive and opening direction and... Anybody who thinks that they can keep still is just delusional. Exactly. So you might as well pick the the other one, the upper one. You're like the other one. Yeah, the good one. <laughs> the, <laughs> the good but one. then, see, that's where I think good or bad is mm. also still an illusion of the mind. Mm. Depends on whomever is actually making that judgment. Yeah, Even I, bad I imagine people people that are good for people who think that the bad decisions are good. Yes, but uh, people that are making making a habit of making nothing but fear-based decisions and closing themselves off and becoming prisoners of their anxiety. I imagine in their own heads, they're thinking that they're making the right decision, but we've, I mean, we kind of, we are starting to collect enough science on this to know that like, yeah, it's kind of woo woo hippie shit, but like, it turns out that there is some actual science behind it. Like people that are more positive age better. You know, you put my uncle next to my dad. My uncle is older. My dad is a negative dude. And my uncle looks younger. Like he just glows. Because my uncle had this attitude of, you know, just let it go. Whatever, life's too short. Like he didn't let that hold himself down. So now we have like the science that does show that positivity, <laughs> like it does help your health. You mean kind of like uh, looking at burners versus regular nine to fivers who are really miserable? Yeah, I agree uh, with that. I'm, I'm just you know, in general, mm -hmm. yeah. how youthful and vibrant absolutely this particular culture or community, if you will, looks in comparison to another community yeah. who's very stringent and focused on, oh, this is the norm. This is how it has to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of like that. So, But to your yeah. point of picking perhaps the more, yeah, lack of a better term, the high road or the positive or the good uh, or more higher mm -hmm. vibrations, if you will. Yeah. Um, true. There's definitely more. Uh, there's more scientific uh, research into that, mm -hmm. and or as far as uh, people's experiences, relatable experiences, uh, to document that. Yeah. Uh, I think that. So I spoke with Shaman Durek. Mm -hmm. um, at uh, Sunset Camp Hell earlier this year. Okay. An opportunity. And he said something really, I think, really wise to me. Everybody's going to choose how they want to, in not so many words. This is how I'm kind of interpreting it. Mm. Everyone's going to choose how they're going to play this life. Some people are going to want to vibrate higher and some people are going to want to vibrate lower. Mm -hmm. And those who choose to want to vibrate higher, they're going to 
search for that and they're going to seek that out. So if we are people who want to seek that out, mm -hmm. higher learning, higher vibration, uh, seeking how to better ourselves in the world around us, then we will find the people. We will find the places to do that. We will enable ourselves and the people around us to make that happen. And yeah. we will also, like coaching says, like attracts like, mm -hmm. and we will attract those onto us. Similarly, those who are going to vibrate at a lower frequency or who choose to uh, vibrate at in a negative state of being or consciousness, that's who they're going to invite to. We're all going to connect with people like that, but they will be able to find them other people who will keep them sustained at that level. Mm -hmm. and that's their choice in this lifetime. Yeah. As a coach or as anybody who's out there wanting to change the world, I think that we can only support and help those who are seeking that. Those who aren't, aren't, and they're going to find their group of people. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to go back to that then, because, uh, so you, at this point you're doing your coaching, but you realize that you are not walking the walk. Correct. Um, and that leads you to do it leads what? me to, okay. So <clears throat> the D-Lab was uh, working on their, um, promoting their event. Dulab is the, for anybody who doesn't know, is the production company that does... Uh, Lightning a Bottle, bottle. Mm -hmm. and also various events throughout the year. Yeah. Right, and they definitely promote a lot of new uh, artists. So you've already fallen in with the burners at this point. Did I? No, you know what? I had just only started going out to some events mm -hmm. that year. Yeah. I had started going out to events uh, probably in 2000, a little bit in 2011, uh very few, and then more so in 2012. Mm -hmm. So I knew that this event was coming up. Yeah. I'd seen some posts or something like that about it, and the thought came back. And this is why I didn't mention to you before. It mm. actually taps into uh, a childhood dream. Mm -hmm. The first thing or first occupation that I ever wanted to do or be was to be an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to Egypt. I wanted to go and dig up bones and yeah. find out mysteries and yeah. learn about the mysteries of the world. Um, I, I mean, I've seen several photos of you in Egypt. So this um, this is very, <laughs> this is like that scene in the movie where all of a sudden it flashes back to a black and white memory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. so I remember I, for some reason, I didn't dare tell that to anybody as my first choice. Mm -hmm. Um. And then my second choice as a child was to be an attorney. Mm -hmm. I, oh, was it attorney first? An archaeologist uh, uh, or an attorney? Well, no, it was archaeologist mm -hmm. first. And then I think it might have been attorney. No, I'm sorry. Attorney was third. Mm. Second was uh, like a psychiatrist. Yeah. Psychologist, psychiatrist. Uh, really wanted to study how my family worked, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what the? Yeah. Um, so psychiatrist was totally turned out by my dad who's like no you're gonna get crazy and things like that so you're I gonna this, get crazy you're gonna go you're gonna okay. turn crazy from right. being a psych all right right exactly <laughs> so i had this huge like thing about like oh my gosh am i crazy am i really crazy I'm, you know could i be crazy complex yeah. for years yeah. and years gotta love that ethnic dad culture yes logic right <laughs> and then i remember well because archaeolo archaeologist for some reason i never asked because i think i felt like they would yeah. automatically my parents would probably be silly. like yeah like what the fuck we're going yeah. to bring you to america from taiwan all right uh immigrate you so that you can what run off to egypt and <laughs> dig up bones yeah right yeah. <laughs> so um no and then with attorney it was like no you're gonna turn you know i said no to attorney huh Right. He huh. actually didn't want me to turn lies into truths and truths oh. into lies. Wow. I'm not going to lie to you. My first place that my brain went to is all the baggage I have with my dad. And uh, what's that? Well, it's, what's you know, the, the, the thing. Well, this A is baggages the thing with dad with with this wow. is the thing that people with immigrant parents deal with is, you know, there's this clash of cultures not just generations you know they mm -hmm. come from a completely different place and time um 
And immediately my mind went to my dad, which is he he would just have really loved if I was very money driven and I never have been. Couldn't couldn't shut off the artist thing. My parents are both money driven, but mm -hmm. uh, slightly different, definitely from a place of lack. But they it's had scarcity. There was a line in the sand, though. There was a line in the sand that your dad drew. I don't want you to turn lies into truth and truth. And that, that is very poetic. That is. I think it must my be dad absolutely does not feel that way. <laughs> I can tell you. My dad, I mean, I had to have that talk with him. I mean, he's, he's fully money driven. He mm. thinks that I'm insane for not being money driven. It's okay. My parents think I'm insane too. Yeah. I, I mean, of course. I think you're kind of insane, but you know, thank you. Like in a very adorable way. So, <laughs> that's so cute. This is this is this is this is why this is why we hang out with the people that we do. Right. Everybody's nuts. Right. It's just that one day I realized, like, oh shit, I, I like nuts. Like I'm right. cool with this. Like I'm obviously okay you guys have crazy. figured something out. Yeah. <laughs> we are. Our, this community different is different levels. Filled, yes. And colors. This this community is filled with crazy fucking people. <laughs> Because we are not the norm. I mean, that's what it comes right. down to. Like you were saying earlier about uh, applying negative or positive traits to things. Society as a whole has applied a negative connotation to, we're joking, we're saying crazy, but abnormal. Right. Um, and My dad says I'm abnormal. My yes. Abnormal You friends. are. You are abnormal. Which is true. Which is awesome. Yes. Uh, that's, that's the point, though, is that society as yes. a whole has applied a negative label to abnormal, when in reality... All that means is that everybody else has agreed that's the norm. Mm -hmm. We are not the norm. We don't line up with what the general population has agreed is supposed to be the way that people should be. And mm -hmm. that's fine. Once you learn to remove that negative positive association with it, go down the rabbit hole and you find that, huh, some of the craziest fucking people I know are also the happiest. Exactly. And some of the most brilliant people I know mm. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because they are willing and they dare to question. Absolutely. Scientifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're coloring totally outside the box. Right. And then realizing that there's this whole other shape here that nobody else thought to color. Exactly. And yeah. that's how we create. Yeah. It, it, this it's, I mean, one of the things that as a photographer I've been, I've come to recently is for many, many years, I was terrified of referring to myself as a photographer because I'm not a particularly technical person. We had this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and for the, I guess I'll recap for the listeners. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and I realized that the people that I admire the most, the people that have made the uh, largest impact in society uh, as artists and as photographers and directors and filmmakers, um, they're not particularly technical. But they had a vision and they just like, all right, I need to pick up a camera because this is the equipment I'm supposed to use. The people that are at the mid-level of a uh, professional, like if you are a professional photographer and you, who knows, have a house, have a couple of kids, like this is your job, this is your living, um, you will stick to the craft. For you, the craft is very important. For you, it's important to understand the light gauges, uh, to understand exactly which settings to use at all times in order to produce something that could be printed on a billboard. Whereas for the crazy artists who just happen to be picking up a camera, that stuff doesn't so much matter. And they end up creating the wildest, newest visions that the rest of uh, culture moves with. They're the tastemakers. The tastemakers tend not to be the most technical people in the world. Mm. And once I had that epiphany, then I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to take a lot of pictures. <laughs> Yay. And I'm going to call myself a photographer and I don't care if I don't know all the technical shit. I'm glad. Yeah. It turns out that I'm not that bad, by the way. <laughs> You're pretty good, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, Utopia, uh, it, this is a San Diego regional burn. Um, it's pretty difficult to take a bad picture there, I feel like. There's so much <laughs> There's amazingness. So much. So right. much amazing this happening. And so I'm assuming you're going to contribute to this uh, idea that you've concocted, mm. by the way. Oh, yes. To have the art a gallery. gallery the yes. art gallery. I would love to. Yay. I would absolutely love to. Media paparazzi paparazzi art gallery. Mm -hmm. Are you doing it? Are you trying to set up the art gallery for Utopia? I'm trying to. Okay. Yeah. I, I, fuck yeah. But with your name on it, because yeah, you know, obviously you're the one that came up with the idea. Yeah. I'm, I'm all over it. <laughs> Happily, I love my, the, my favorite is that photo of Boone. Did you see that one? The black no, and white one. Okay. I gotta see it. I gotta I'll show see it to you okay, after cool. after awesome. it finishes. Please. Um, but but let's go back here to this. So archaeologist, archaeologist. Um, so let me go back. Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> so 
all of those things. I told two souls, basically, all my life of mm -hmm. this desire to go to Egypt. Not even my desire to become an archaeologist. I kept feeling the sense of it would not be accepted. Yeah. That people would view that negatively somehow. And I think that uh, most of my life I've had a certain sense of what people would accept and couldn't accept. Mm -hmm. And so I played really well this role. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all my life um and so that was part of the thing with the ending of that last corporate job mm -hmm. as well i was tired of acting in real life now you're hitting something that's very close to home i i um every once in a while it's important for people to stop and ask themselves do these people my family my friends etc cetera, etc cetera, do they love me or do they love this character that I've created? Mm -hmm. This role that I'm playing every yeah, day. Yeah, very good point. Yeah. And then especially if they are so in love with this character that I've created that is catered to their needs mm -hmm. and their desires. Yeah. It's not their fault. That's no, my fault. No, it's not. It's my fault. Yeah. And that enables them to be who they are because of you know, what I believe to be selflessness is mm -hmm. to be able to enable others to allow themselves to be who they were. Absolutely. This was back in the day, right? Yeah. Um, but, and in doing so, though, when I decided to change and be more me mm -hmm. and more and more me, um, then more often than not, those who love us or those who are familiar with us in that particular character start going, what the hell is happening? Yeah. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Burn a podcast. All right, all right, all right. Just going to take a, a quick, uh, quick little break, little short break to tell you about some cool shit that's happening um, around, uh, hopefully, you, uh, listener. Um, there's the Naughty Elf Invasion that's happening on December 19th. Uh, the, it basically says here it's uh, like SantaCon, but with <laughs> uh, it's like SantaCon, but with less food drive. Um, it's going to end up at Kava Lounge, which is our, our, our little, one of our burner homes here in San Diego. So if you're in the San Diego area, uh, join in on the Naughty Elf Invasion. There's a Facebook events page for it. You can look for that. Uh, there's the uh, next event is the third annual White Blissmas Charity Ball. Blissmas. Uh, that's going to be on December 20th. Blissmas is a fundraiser for participants who want to bring their creativity to Bequinox. Uh, it's the overnight regional event that's held uh, in March in Joshua Tree. So the uh, White Blissmas Charity Ball, it's a bit of a tongue twister, that's the fundraiser for that. So there's going to be you know all kinds of cool shit there, your, your typical stuff, your DJs, your art workshops. Uh, the audience at Blissmas is going to vote on projects and then um, it looks like they're going to be distributing $15,000 based on your percentage of votes to uh, the projects that are going to be going out to Joshua Tree. Uh, in addition to voting on the grants for projects, everyone will be voting on the effigy that's going to be burned at Equinox. So that's pretty badass. Uh, this event is going to be at 10437 Burbank Boulevard in North Hollywood. You can probably look that up over on Facebook as well. There's the New Moon Beach Burn. That's on December 20th. Come celebrate the winter solstice and new moon in Capricorn. We will have a simple solstice ceremony at sunset, culminating in a big bonfire burn. Uh, we'll have wood for the fire, but please bring anything burnable you would like to contribute. And then blah, blah, blah. You know what? Just here. Just go look up New Moon Beach Burn. That's going to be at Fiesta Island, which is uh, in San Diego as well. Uh, Fiesta Island's not really an island. It's more like a peninsula. But anyway, it's, it's just more like a, a clump of dirt. Uh, it doesn't, it's not as sexy as it sounds, uh, but it's still cool. It's a good place to have a little bonfire. Uh, Freaks on Ice! Exclamation point. That's on December 27th. Join us for a night of chillin'. Uh, I get it. That's adorable. Uh, let's uh, take over the ring. The San Diego Ice Arena. That's going to be 11048 Ice Skate Palace in San Diego. Um, hey, I know you're probably saying, how come there's so many San Diego events? Oh, I don't know. If you have an event in your neck of the woods, why don't you shoot it over to Producer Meg so we can uh, dilute some of these event uh, statements here, these announcements. Um, New Year's Eve is going to be the Yellow Vortex Electric Cocoon five-year anniversary. That's in Apple Valley. Uh, I have a feeling it's going to be freezing balls there on New Year's Eve. Uh, but uh, if you're into that sort of thing, if you're into raving and raging for a couple of nights uh, in the Lloydian Reservation, by all means, 
It's a pretty beautiful, amazing spot. That's where San Diego's Regional Burn Utopia is held. Uh, holds a very, very close place in my heart. Um, so just uh, check out those events that are coming up. And down the road a little, little bit, it looks like dates have been released for Electric Poncho. Woohoo! Electric Poncho is in Mexico uh, at Canyon de Guadalupe. Uh, it's absolutely mind blowing. Uh, it's a place where you'll walk around and you'll wonder if you're actually on acid because it's so beautiful and you'll wonder if it's actually kicked in yet. And it, it, it has. It's just that it's that beautiful. Um, the dates have been released. Uh, it, that is going to be Thursday, April 23rd through Monday, April 27th, 2015, of course. You can look up more information over at Electric Poncho. Dot com. So all kinds of cool shit coming up. Make sure you check those out. And uh, you can always tune in to Burner Podcast blog or Twitter page. We try to send out announcements for events and stuff there too as well. And we're working on uh, a pretty cool like events calendar that eventually will end up on BurnerPodcast.com. So stay tuned for that. So yeah, I'm going to let you guys get back to the interview. And uh, I'm going to stop talking. Welcome home. Do you think the guy that you almost married would be into the person you are today? Um, there were a couple. There were actually... There was a couple you there, almost there married? Are, there were a few different ones, actually. There was a few different people you almost married? A couple. Oh, you were just on that mission. No, <laughs> not really. Actually, the thing was, I wasn't mm. at the time. That's yeah. the thing. It was just like, eh, but maybe... No, this last one, though. You said the, the one you were with for a year. No, this last one, Um, I was interested, and I thought that there were some talks, but again, in mm. case... Would would Neither he here, would no. he would he still be infatuated with the person that you are today though is the question. I don't know. What did what did uh what line of work was he in? You don't have to say exact profession. What Law. field? Okay. <laughs> so he was a little bit more but normal. Actually, no. <laughs> Environmental law. No, no, it wasn't that. <laughs> Nonprofit law. <laughs> we had to do with credit law. Okay, but so that that's pretty normal. <laughs> it's, it's pretty normal. But I'm talking about like I think that he himself is a burner at heart as well, mm, and yeah, probably yeah. trying to search for this um, community. That may have um, been what attracted you to him to begin with. That he had that sense of a thing that you were looking for inside of yourself at that time. Possibly, I think mm. I think that we all attract people who are like us in some way fashion or form or Absolutely. a reflection of us Absolutely. in some facet and so uh definitely beautiful amazing um also turbulent time with him but i'm so thankful to have had that time um i think you know i don't know how to think in, th in those terms but that we were definitely supportive and i think that i've uh since then, he was actually helpful in part of my settlements. Mm. So I asked him to represent awesome. me and mm. on the phone and talk to a couple of these card companies and say, I'm representing so and so. Yeah. That was the uh, that was one of the major parts of the story that was missing then. You had a credit uh, lawyer as, well, a, <laughs> as a boyfriend. Not all the time. Yeah. So because I had tried something. Mm. And then at one point I was scared because I was being sued. Yeah. And um, I'd called him. We'd broken apart. Um, but uh, he helped me to figure out what were the inf what information was behind it, mm. and uh, allowed me to prepare myself to for the dude that came knocking on the door. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so that when they came up, I was able to go, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, it was the second time they came yeah. to, he came to the door. So it was like, waiting. Well, thank you. Thank you mm. for serving me. Yeah. <laughs> How much did Have you owe that day. one that uh, caused them to actually come to your door? That one, it was B of A. It was uh, a little bit over nine grand. Mm. Yeah. And they sued me. Yeah. Which I was like, oh, really? Okay. Like, really? Don't you guys have anything better to do? Right. Yeah. What about all those hundreds of thousands of dollars that yeah. people are owe in mortgage? Yeah. Right. And so, um, and they sued me for that. And I'm sure I could say this. I settled for <laughs> under, I settled for under a third. Nice. But then, granted, note, note that I've been paying yeah. For like the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically. Yeah. So essentially, on all of these cards I've had, um, I've basically paid 
I'm pretty sure I've paid at least maybe two, three times mm -hmm. what I owed them. So it wasn't something like that. Oh, I've been paying. I haven't been paying all these bills, yeah. but every single bill I paid more than the minimum every single month. Talking about credit is going to go on the description of this episode. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. a, we, okay. We've, we've done, we've done a joke, but let's get past that to the, uh, yes, back to the archaeology. Archaeology. You've oh, only told like so two bad. people about this. I told two people and then finally it's coming up where it's like, uh, okay, so Egypt keeps coming up. I see it in adverts and I see it elsewhere. People are talking about, mm. friends are talking about it. Um, I was coaching someone at the time and i remember going to your house and uh for face to face or uh, in person coaching session and then she had a sphinx cat yeah mm. yeah and the then, hairless ones yes yeah. right and so that's one thing and then there it was just this that's something that i remember right now but there were a succession of things that kept reminding me of egypt mm -hmm. and just other parts of daily life yeah and I, because I was like, hey, I every know. day when DuckTales came on TV and there's this part when Egypt. they're in Egypt. Yeah. Egypt pops up. Yes. Right. Yeah. Here and there. The mummy part two. Is right. Out. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're, they're in town. And then Whatever. there's the mummy three with Jet Li. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, and so um, I now believe in synchron synchronicities mm -hmm. because it was just everything kept popping up. Yeah. And. Uh, my initial thought of I'm not I don't have money for Egypt. No. And, and in the past, those two people that I actually talked to about Egypt, they talked me out of it. Like, no, 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 it's too dangerous right now. And this spans from like high school on, and so it finally hit me one day. It might have been Utopia. <laughs> Utopia of 2012. It might have been Utopia. Okay. And um, I actually um had this idea at the time to somewhere around them and to maybe like do um, a documentary, mm -hmm. film a documentary. Who says I can't film a documentary? About what? Um, I wasn't quite sure at the time. You just wanted to make a documentary. I wanted to because I, I actually wrote down a, a thousand one things I wanted to do before I wanted to die, I mean, before I died. And one of them was <laughs> make a documentary. Yeah, make my own films Yeah. Um, amongst other things. Right. And it's kind of like, wow, what if I can, you know, do both go to Egypt and make a film? Yeah. Why can't I? My friend Ben Stewart, who did, uh, he's uh, the filmmaker of Climatica. Mm -hmm. He made that. I remember that year I met him, saw the film, saw him in his band, um, Hyrosonic, and they were just like going for things and. Uh, he had this incredible spirit of moving moving forward even if he he's never gone to film school he's never made a film before yeah. made a documentary and is a speaker and just continues to search in search of what he believes in and and being a speaker and being outspoken mm -hmm. and so definitely an inspiration for me to ponder what am i waiting for yeah Am I going to, how much longer am I going to wait? How much longer do I have to wait before uh, going to Egypt, planning for Egypt? Yeah. Or planning for a film or going to film school. I've done production work in the past, but I've never actually done film or studied film. So you finally decided to pull the trigger. I did. Um, sorry, this is getting long. <laughs> um, it's okay I had written my friend uh, Francis Kenny who's a cinematographer and he about this idea of mine what do you think of this idea didn't respond um, and a couple of I think I can't remember I thought that he kind of blew me off i totally felt like maybe oh you know what you know in my mind i started making up these stories of maybe i didn't have the jobs and he's mm -hmm. too busy to deal with me what well have you pitched a concept to him yet or are you just saying let's go make a documentary no no I, I pitched a concept to him about what, what, what is do you the think? concept i think it was more of what do you think of this idea of my making a, a documentary in uh egypt for this particular event it was different from what's currently being filmed. Mm. <clears throat> it was multiple POVs mm. 
have selecting maybe five different individuals to strap on GoPros or something like that, and then film their own individual collective experience, uh, individual experience, and then putting it together as a full fledged like experience of that event. You but you didn't know what the event was going to be at Egypt. Just the country of Egypt is an event. Uh, it was the Great Convergence as okay. an event. So okay. it was supposed to be an event where it was really a party, right? Mm-hmm. But kind of as a party, but definitely as a tour um, to explore Egypt. And there were supposed to be ceremonies, and then there's supposed to be this Nile cruise to explore and visit these sites. What is the Great Convergence? I'm not familiar with it. Oh, okay. The Great Convergence was essentially, first off, it was a three-day event in Cairo, Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, at the foot of the Great Pyramids, uh, from the Dew Lab and also Tamar L. Sachs, who uh, created this event, he had a vision. I later learned that he wanted to create this event to be able to go out to Egypt um, with his friends, with people of like mindedness. And um, yeah, Dew Lab is involved with the event that happens in Egypt? Right. Wow, this I did was, not know this that. This was what it was. Impressive. And so, and for 10 years, maybe pl- 10 plus years, um, from what I understand, that Tamar had been talking about this, mm-hmm. about this dream of his. And finally, he teamed up with uh, the Do Lab, and they made it happen. Mm. Uh, there were about 250 of us total. Oops, I gave it away. Give <laughs> the number again? Yeah. The 2250? Uh, I mean, uh, us. But yeah. there were about 250 people who went to this particular event. Um, normally, if mm-hmm. you're aware of the Do Labs uh, Lightning in a Bottle, 15,000 to 20,000 people. Yeah, yeah. So essentially... It's like the burner the, EDC. Pretty much, <laughs> kind of thing. And it's uh, so much smaller scale. Mm-hmm. Much, much smaller scale. But mostly people from the U.S., People from all over, of course, different mm-hmm. countries went. And what an amazing, eclectic group of individuals, uh, event producers, uh, musicians, producers, uh, uh, writers, mm-hmm. uh, astrologers, all kinds. So th- this, is, this is the idea that you pitched covering well, this event? The idea that I pitched was to... Pick select individuals. Mm-hmm. Five like individuals, yeah. Five individuals, like producer, a uh, producer of the event, mm-hmm. or a musician, an attendee, and things like that, mm-hmm. and to um, film together and collectively create what that experience really was and recreate it in such a way that we can share with the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, so that's not just from one POV, it's yeah. from multiple POVs. So initially, it was that. And I didn't know if that was feasible. Pitched it. He didn't respond back. I went to Utopia. Um, and I also went to uh, another event that I just forgot right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but Utopia was uh, the event that inspired me to ask for what I want. Yeah. And I don't think I asked him yet at the time. I feel like maybe I didn't. But maybe I did. Sorry, I did ask him. I didn't get a response, mm-hmm. and so I was creating stories in my head, like yeah. I'm in, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling, worthy. I'm not worthy. Yeah. You know, he's he's not gonna respond. But after that, I mean, with the Utopia, three different conversations, mm-hmm. amazing individuals, three d- consecutive days. Egypt. No, it was about <laughs> different things. Yeah. It all culminated with, you have to ask for what you want. Mm. And so for me, it was like, wow, what is it that I'm talking about and I'm not asking for? Yeah. So I shot out another uh, email to him just to check in. I'm like, you know what? If he's going to ignore me, then he's going to ignore me. But I'm yeah. going to just ask him real quick. Yeah. And he responded, I'm working 18 hours, sh- 18 hours on set. Uh-huh. And I've been super slammed. But I think you got something there. I got an idea. Come on over and talk. Yeah. And I'll give you some pointers. So he gave me cinematography lessons. So what did, what, did, what did the idea evolve into? It evolved into more of... Um, so it there were a lot of people involved to help me to kind of start figuring out exactly what that went into. And I finally named it Dream Shift Inspire. Mm. Because it was also based on me uh, and my journey. 
but I wanted it to be my journey seen through the eyes of others. Interesting. And through that, discovering what dreams we all have. What are the dreams that we have? Are they all similar dreams, essentially? Ultimately, at the core. Um, and then, what conscious shifts are we making to realize those dreams? Mm -hmm. And in doing so, how are we inspiring the world by just inspiring ourselves? And these connections are happening around this event. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It is really more of... Um, so part of it was my journey of how I made it there. Mm -hmm. So I started filming little messages by myself already. And that journey to Egypt. And long story longer, <laughs> uh, I won the Soul Scholarship to the Great Convergence mm. in November. Um, I did not know that was happening at the time. When I decided to go on this adventure, I decided, you know what, I'm going to do whatever I can to uh, to make it to Egypt. It's my one chance to take advantage and not let an opportunity pass me by again. How long were you there? Ten days. So you're there for ten days. You're filming this whole time, by the way. Not the whole time, part okay. of the time, just depending on how things were mm -hmm. moving. Yep. Was there, I mean, Egypt is not the safest place in the world. Um, no, it wasn't at that time either. Yeah. And we're, and you're in Cairo, Cairo a lot of time? We're in Cairo. We traveled along the Nile. Okay. All the way down to Aswan. Mm -hmm. And... Because uh, a lot of, um, for, I mean, I, I imagine our listeners are pretty well versed with this kind of stuff, but... Um, it's Egypt has this kind of more fluffy reputation because of the history, but we do know that, like for example, like a lot of the scariest terrorist groups, like they're rooted back from Egypt. Like that's what a lot of people don't realize. Um, and we, like Brotherhood of Islam, you know that that's, that that came out of Egypt, and and we don't really realize it because the Egyptian government historically has spent great energy in brushing that stuff out, under the carpet. You know, they keep like heavy, lots of space between like the tourist areas and where people actually live. It's there's pretty common knowledge uh, before the uprising started happening that if anybody, like if locals tried to communicate with tourists, it would not be strange for a police officer to come and stop them and start harassing the person and say, why are you talking to this tourist? So... This is where you are right now. This is, by the way, this is 20, 2012 that December you're there. December 21st. Okay. And then the uprisings happened in 2013, am I right? Actually, it started in 2012. It started in 2012, there okay. Were, there, was, there were already uprisings in Twitter Fair yeah. Square. So you're there while there's things starting to happen. Yeah, it was definitely one of those things where people were like, don't go. Yeah. It's a bad idea. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, but for me, and... I don't know for others, but for me, it was once in a lifetime opportunity, potentially. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I had the opportunity to get there, I'm going to go. Because how many years do I have left? How many days do I have left that I don't know about? And if this is really my mm -hmm. childhood dream, I'm going to do whatever it takes, you know, within reason, yeah. to get there. What was... What was what was the most dramatically different thing about Egypt than what you imagined it would be? Hmm. Is there something that you just were not expecting? How warm and friendly some of the people that we came in contact with were. You didn't expect people to be warm and friendly? It's not that the warm and friendly part. It's the... I think at that time for me, it was how aligned, I, I know I'm throwing jargon around, but yeah. aligned uh, synchronistically. Yeah. Woo woo. Yeah, yeah, the woo woo words, <laughs> right? To, um, that I w was feeling with people that I was meeting mm -hmm. left and right. You were yeah. attracting the kinds of people that you wanted to be around. 
Woo woo. Yeah. <laughs> they just were yeah. showing up, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't, listen, I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I've obviously historically been the first one to make fun of stuff like this, but I have discovered that I don't know what it is. For some reason, when you put your intentions out to the universe, these people start showing up into your life. Exactly. I don't know what the science behind it is. I don't know how the fuck it's happening. It might be some, you know, psychological thing that I'm not paying attention to, but And hence part happens. of my project yeah. is how it evolved, really, because yeah. it's that whole exploration of, uh, it's not even really, how is this happening? It's more of like, is this really happening? Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. if this really is happening and on a broader scale, what more can we do? Do you have... Do you have like a, a thesis statement for your documentary? Is there a specific point you're trying to prove or did you just decide you're going to start filming your journey and figure it out from there? Um, I started by saying I was going to figure uh, film my journey and mm -hmm. figure it out. Things fell through. I couldn't raise enough money to get my actual photographer or my videographer there with me i hope he's not mad with me last time we met <laughs> you can give like him a, he was a public apology it seemed like he was really upset at me i don't know i felt really because you couldn't vibes. take him to egypt yeah and i was Aww. like i couldn't raise enough money and i was able to raise enough money for my cameras yeah, at the time yeah. actually yeah. and stroke of luck perhaps or stroke of synchronicity perhaps or everything in alignment whatever yeah. it might be that I was actually able to win that particular scholarship from the do lab mm. and but to go and and huge gratitude to the do lab yeah. for offering me this opportunity and to be able to do the things that I'm doing now yeah um so but you to your point I lost your mm. question sorry no it, well is there is there a thesis statement thesis statement. now because we know it wasn't when you first started filming. No, it wasn't. It was more of, hey, collective experience. Let's yeah. see from multiple POVs. And then to the point of what I was mentioning to you earlier of um, what dreams do we have? To, are we sh all sharing together? And what conscious shifts are we making mm -hmm. in realizing our dreams? And in so doing, how are we inspiring the world by inspiring ourselves? Mm -hmm. So... Presently, what I'm working on is a three-part series to Dream Shift Inspire instead of just one block piece mm -hmm. where I get to explore that with the people that I've tracked along this entire journey, not just the great convergence anymore. Yeah. Partly because I couldn't get enough footage there because yeah. I, <laughs> I uh, had my GoPro stolen yeah. from my hotel room. Really? Yeah, I had... I had amazing footage of the interior and exterior of the Great Pyramid. Mm. As in, like, nobody in front of me, and it looked like I'm just trekking along. It was like National Ge Geographic, nothing, mm. nobody in front of you footage type of thing. But, oh well, things happen for a reason. Um, it inspired a trilogy. It did. It inspired yeah. more. And people kind of dropping like flies. I mean, like 80, 85% of the people at the end got sick. Really? And it was like, I, it was like, I couldn't really film sick people. Sick from what? Like kebab? It was weird. It was like <laughs> people were just dropping like flies from some weird Nile flu or something like that. Oh, wow. And I Instead had, of like Montezuma's revenge, it was like Cleopatra's revenge or something. <laughs> I think I saw mm. it happen from um, the Valley of the Kings. Mm-hmm. When I saw my photographer, uh, one of my photographers out there, he was amazing. And he, um, I remember him taking off his shoes to walk into the tombs. Next thing I know, get back to the, to the shuttles and, and he's there and he's just feeling super ill. Mm. You know, it was like from when we were on the bus and lively to just bam. Oh, wow. It was weird. And then so many people were just like exhausted or whether they're, you know, them producers or if they were just attendees, they were just sick. And this stuff all found its way into the documentary or did, did it get lost? with the? Footage? It got lost, actually, mm. because when I asked people if I could film them, um, a lot of people refused yeah. to be filmed in that state of being. Yeah. And I can totally understand that. However, what I discovered through that, there was... There were a few people who did agree to still be filmed 
despite how exhausted and tired they were. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I found so much courage when they did that. Yeah. That, that was inspiring, at least for me. Absolutely. So, so you, so you, you come back, you've lost a bunch of footage, you, because the cameras got stolen. How does that shift into a trilogy? (laughs) <laughs> the uh the discovery was really more of this is um i'm trying to address an attack too big of a topic probably mm-hmm. uh because i was looking at a 27 minute piece and so it's probably way too big to address within the time frame that i have but what was the topic because you had said you didn't even have like a thesis statement you wanted to explore what is so what is what is the thing that you want people to take away from from watching at that time what was the at thing the time, you wanted them to okay. take away at the time the takeaway was uh to really be able to observe this amazing group of individuals mm. coming together gathering together to explore egypt mm. to understand its past and its present mm-hmm. this group of uh, rather youthful individuals who are willing to go in mm-hmm. during amidst this trying and difficult time that people consider dangerous mm-hmm. uh but is considered a for lack of a better word like a holy mm-hmm. time period the yeah. end of the mayan calendar yeah. to actually explore and be be explorer so i wanted to document mm-hmm. that initially yeah. but then after a lot of your stuff got stolen and you come back and you decide that you want to tell another story, a greater part of the story, which is what leads you to making it a trilogy. Yes. And then that was more of going into other festivals and starting to collect more interviews because the people that I had wanted interviews with that, excuse me, the people that I wanted interviews with weren't all available. Mm-hmm. So how am I going to continue and finish my documentary? And it was really going to other events and festivals and then finding people and asking them questions about what their dreams were. What kind of people were you looking for? Anybody. You're just walking <laughs> around. You're like, you, with the Native American headdress, come here. <laughs> sometimes. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it's more of, okay, we've had a minor conversation and I just feel like asking you, would you like, yeah. Can I film you for a bit? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Some people are willing and some people aren't. So do you do you still at this point, like, are you just pressing forward without having a clear vision of what the end of this thing is going to be? I think that, so Francis gave me some really good pointers and that really helped to guide me in the mm-hmm. sense that... Francis is the... The, the cinematographer. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so he said to me, he started out as a documentary mm-hmm. filmmaker and uh i'm going to butcher what he said but <laughs> essentially in films with regular film cinematography or cin- cinematic films it's the telling of a story yes okay you have the plot you have the script and everything laid out but with documentaries it's an exploration mm-hmm. and you explore and you may not end up where you started yeah and so i'm so thankful for francis to have given me that guideline so that i wouldn't be stuck in this mindset of it has to be this certain way it's kind of like yeah. life right? yeah that's 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 I, I mean that's wonderful and i think that what you're describing is the reason a lot of people wanted to get into documentary filmmaking um I just feel like pointing out, though, that there is an entire school of documentary filmmakers who dramatically disagree with that. For example, if you'd like to see any of their work, yes. there's a lot of horse shit on Netflix oh. made by oh, no. Republican wait, documentary do really filmmakers. Two, wait, actually, I take... Well, like the ones that... like open. God, how many documentaries are there out there about how Obama is double? I assure you, they started out wanting for that to be the answer, and then they shot a bunch of footage and put it together. They're propaganda pieces, but they still are, can be considered documentaries. Because right. um, even on our side, you know, we have a somebody like Michael Moore, um, mm-hmm. who I'm not a massive fan of because I've caught him exaggerating things. Um, but there's somebody else who I think has a 
fairly clear thesis statement of where he's going. But you're going the, sort of the old school way of documentary. You're going like the journalist approach to documentary filmmaking. You're out there. You've done this thing in Egypt. You're back here. You're meeting more and more of these interesting people at these interesting events. And something, you're just letting the vibe take you to the next thing. I am kind of allowing that vibe to take me to the next thing and not, I've discovered through my experience of, of forcing interviews, mm -hmm. per, particularly at events, I think, where people are, uh, tend to have a million things on their minds and everything else that's going on. Or in their bodies. <laughs> no comment. No comment. No. <laughs> and whatever it might be. And so um, I set myself with the expectations of acquiring XYZ interviews and then have yeah, mm -hmm. I've let myself down yeah. by expecting those, right? Yeah. So you and let go of expectation. I've let go of those expectations and then also really feel into, okay, does this feel right? If I'm not feeling right about this, mm -hmm. then maybe it's not the right time. Yeah, yeah. Artistically, yeah. from an artistic perspective versus I think I should. And so and most of my life, I've lived, with, lived my life doing the shoulds. Mm -hmm. I think I should do this because X, Y, and Z. But now it's more of, does this feel right to me? Yeah. Does this feel good to me? So it's a documentary that's being shot and directed by you, but it's being produced by Wu Wu. <laughs> <laughs> the Wu Wu energy of the universe. It's being produced by the Wu Wu yeah. energy of the universe yeah. mutually. And also, for instance, if I asked you, would you be willing to leave an inspirational message to your future self? Absolutely. I am a publicity whore. I will do anything, anytime. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> so what, I'm what here made, this weekend. Nah, yeah, nah, I, what, so what made you what made you decide it has to be a trilogy? Um, I sat there one day and just, I realized that it really is kind of three separate things I'm working on. Mm -hmm. I'm asking people, what are your dreams? What dreams do you have? Excuse me. And then what conscious shifts are you making? Have you made and are you making now towards realizing those mm -hmm. dreams? Mm -hmm. And I guess it's more of the way that I would like for it to be pieced together that I see it in my mind's eye. Yeah. And also... How are you inspiring the world? And initially what I wanted to do was to profile people who are inspiring the world with what they're doing. Yeah. And then it morphed into what inspirational message would you leave to your future self? Mm -hmm. Because it was more, it was actually, it started that way, but then it, it morphed into realizing that it's actually kind of like three separate topics sort of. Yeah. And to mesh all three together, it'd be like, oh, Okay. And but at the same time it's part of my paradigm, it's part of my journey. And this is sorry, realistically, it is my story. Yeah. Um I do debate with myself sometimes of how much control I want to have over the outcome. Because if I have more control over the outcome, then it's not scientific in my mind. So I but if I let it just roam and be free, then it's just like, oh, whatever happens, happens. Yeah. So to your point of what is the thesis, um, I'm focusing on the thesis presently being what inspirational message would you leave to your future self? And utilizing that as a catalyst to discover more yeah. and, and exploration of multiple things. For you, the person who's leaving, just a second, for you sure. to leave that message and see what your experience is. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, when I send it back to you to see what your experience is then, if it is indeed what you need it then as an experiment for me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to see you on a um, broader scale or, or wide range of uh, broad scope of people, um, what percentage of people who do leave messages, who do receive it and, you know, respond back, that's exactly what they need. And then I could determine certain other questions that would evolve from that. How powerful are we really if we're talking about the scientific, yeah. synchronistic 
uh, elements of something in my mind is the choices that we make in our lives. Mm -hmm. We tend to look back and go, did I make a good choice? Was that the right choice? What if every choice that we make is always the right choice? And everything that happens to us is always the right thing that happens to us. The perfect thing that leads us to where we're supposed to be. Mm. I wouldn't be where I am today had I not lost my job. Yeah. I am so much happier today and so much more authentically me. More me than I've ever been in my life. Yeah. I love acting. I love being on stage. It's so much fun. Right? Mm. But... I want to be able to be me each and every day. I'm tired of acting like someone else, what someone else would like to see me as. Yeah, you want to act on stage, not while you're walking around in normal life. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The, <laughs> yeah, uh, failing forward is what uh, my, my creative partner calls it. Failing forward. Yeah, it's actually the name of his next album. Pretty soon to be dropped. Shit. Check out Kill C Ray at twitter.com. Wait, uh, yeah, I think, we do wait, random, wait, random shameless plug. Right, please uh, <laughs> yeah, my, do my, the plug all over again. Cause... Sure. Uh, well, it's, you know, it, this stuff will be all over the place. But, That's true, but we still need uh, the sure. proper plug. My uh, my creative partner's name is Kill C Ray. You can find him at Kill C Ray on Twitter. Uh, can you spell Kill C Ray? Yeah, K I L L, the letter C R E Y. Yes, and his next album is called Failing Forward which is a, a topic that we discuss quite a bit on our other podcast. Which What's is your other? Crappy Awesome. Oh, yeah. I didn't know you had more than one podcast going on. Yeah, well, that one I've been co-hosting for three years, over three really? years Really? Yeah. This one is brand new. This is episode three that you're going to be on. This is scary. Yeah. And it's... um. If yeah. if I do end up getting sued by my own company, I need support. Any attorneys, please let me know. <laughs> I will. I will be happy to share all that. With my 25 million listeners, which I will no doubtedly have in a week. Actually, I have no money for them to sue, so... Well, I mean, that was going to be my question. You know, mine, this is a personal question. It is a really personal question, yes, but go ahead. but I'm going to ask anyway. Go ahead. Um, how the fuck are you paying your rent, you know, since you're not working right now and you're making documentary? I am working, actually. Oh, what are you doing? I'm a life coach. Oh, that's full-time I'm an thing. emerging leader coach. That's beautiful. <laughs> you're doing the, the full-time life coach thing. That's awesome. So, um, I don't obviously the reason... get a lot but yeah. i am still because i'm in the midst of expanding my business yeah. and expanding my horizons and attracting new clients how many hours a week does that take up for you it really varies i will admit i've been lazy <laughs> um so per week maybe 20 mm. uh I could be doing a lot more to amplify that, of course, but I am also adopting this new, I guess, ideology or methodology of not pressing certain things of, <laughs> it's funny, kind of being, being the flow and yet also going with the flow at the same time. Yeah. Um, doing the things that I feel really called to do such as leading and facilitating workshops. Mm -hmm. I facilitate Tribe Circle. I facilitate you, Magical Manifestor, you, mm. uh, and Art of Self-Love. Yeah. Um, I'm really fortunate to be able to uh, be facilitating workshops in California and also now in Taiwan. Where, yay. Um, That's what you were doing back in, because we spoke on the phone for like an hour while you were back home. Was it an hour? Yeah. I felt like it was two and a half. Was it like two? It might have been. Yeah. I don't know. You were the one paying for it, so... <laughs> <laughs> it was great yeah. great combo um was but that boring huh <laughs> felt what? Like, i'm just kidding no it was so good it was, it was so good that time passed and then somebody else had asked us asked me the, earlier like oh i'm like oh yeah we talked for oh wait it was, it was plenty of well well we started talking about dmt and then when you start that conversation you end up going on for another hour and a half all kinds of yeah yeah exactly yeah. i think we should uh yeah <laughs> Have that conversation again. Sometime. We shall. But um, where were we? Uh, life coaching. The reason, by the way, I was asking is because um, it's the same question that I have as a working artist, as I'm sure anybody out there has about, hey, I want to go do something awesome with my life, but how am I going to pay my rent? 
And uh, you answered it. It looks like you have an occupation where you make your own hours. Well, that's also part of the reason why I uh, decided to pursue coaching was also because at the time I was looking for an opportunity, a, a job where allowed me to travel. Mm-hmm. A lot of us is in our community want to travel, right? Yes. Um, I've been really fortunate with all of my tech jobs to be able to travel all over the world. Mm-hmm. I think that I've willed that into my my scope of opportunity yeah um and that i worked in sales jobs of course i worked my ass off and then some um and it wasn't until later towards the end when i really decided to really experience the places that i was visiting for work mm-hmm. but for mm-hmm. this uh, i was focusing on coaching i could be anywhere i could coach people because most of my sessions are uh over the phone or else they're VIP in-person sessions. Mm-hmm. So where I'm spending like four or five hours with someone. But other than that, it, it can be more just depending on, you know, what's feasible. But for uh, coaching sessions, is usually an hour or so via phone. And I prefer the phone because on the phone, we're not having this eye-to-eye contact. People mm-hmm. have an opportunity, my clients have an opportunity to be themselves in and kind of, and just be real, be yeah. really authentic, and not feel judged because there's somebody in front of them, mm. like a therapy session, right? Interesting, yeah. Um, and it allows people to just think a little bit more, doodle if they need to, whatever it is. But that's fascinating. I I totally go the opposite direction when really? I'm when I'm looking to yeah talk to somebody. Really? Yeah, even if I'm in a in sort of a coach mentor position. Interesting. If I can do it in person, I prefer that. But that's a that's really fascinating what you're describing because you're you're taking into account factors that I may not have been taking. You know, there are things that are happening. Like there's this person sitting in front of you that you don't know. Is it a male? Is it a female? Uh, are you intimidated by them? Are you attracted to them? Like there's all these things that you're removing from the equation Absolutely. by making it a phone conversation. Exactly, and that's the whole reason for that because mm-hmm. then all of these judgments are out of the way. Yeah. For my client and for me, mm-hmm. even though if it's in person, I'm just focused. It's like this interview, I'm all over the place. I can be and I am all over the place mm-hmm. in my own personal life. But yes. when I'm with a client, though, because my focus is on them, it's not on me. On me, then I'm kind of like, I'll lead you in all sorts of rabbit holes, right? Yeah. With them, it's kind of like how you're keeping me on track with. Yeah a certain flow that's in part what i do i help to keep them on track according to what their initial intended intention is yeah do you where do the majority of your new clients come from um majority of my new clients i would have to say friends of friends um, more, more recently have been kind of like sort of acquaintances. Mm. I want to say sort of acquaintances. They're more acquaintances. Yeah. And yeah. so it's really that. And so I realized the importance of my getting myself out there. Yeah. I had a, I have another friend who was doing coaching and she was, she stopped doing it because she said it was very successful. So people would kind of really figure out what they want to do and then be done. And you have to constantly keep chasing after the next client. So there is that, right? Mm. But then there's also the part of, so yes, there are some clients and I've definitely been there where it's like, I want to help somebody. Mm -hmm. I want to be an assistant, assisting or an assistant to that um, transformation. You want to assist their transformation? I think that there's two ways of looking at that. One Mm. is, we're always working to, as a coach, we're working to transition them out of working with us realistically. Yeah. Realistically. Yeah. How quickly does that happen? I can do that in one session. I think I can do that in one session. Mm. I experienced doing that a lot <laughs> yeah. where people are like, oh, I'm... great. I'm, yeah. I'm done. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm yeah. good. Thanks. Thanks. Three <laughs> session. Yeah. I'm done. Right. And so, but then there are also, there's the other philosophy 
in coaching where it takes um, time mm. for to adopt a certain habit, yes. right, uh, or to replace one habit with another. Mm. And so initially, we can be like, "Yeah, I know exactly what to do. I don't need this person or this support anymore." Yeah, I can go do it. And there's some people who can do that, and there are some people who will be like, "Yes," and then dip right back into whatever is the the norm for them. Mm-hmm. So, whatever works for whomever. I'm more about if it helps you, great. If you feel like you've gotten to where you would like to go, awesome. Mm -hmm. As a coach, my thing is more of how can I be of a service as a friend? And sometimes that's part of the difficult part where it's like you know someone and you care about them. It's like, oh, I care about Mm you. You're like a friend. So to some extent... Yeah. yeah, no, because I mean, even just speaking to like friends, I mean, to some extent, the documentary that you're the series that you're working on is very deeply interconnected with what you're doing as a profession, which is, I guess, part of the other uh, lesson for you starving artists out there. Find something that intertwines with what you're already doing to pay your rent, <laughs> ideally. <laughs> So you're not doing something dramatically different. You know, the two are feeding each other. The two, you know, you don't have a day job that's dramatically different from the thing that you're pouring your passion into. Well, for me, what I really learned was what I felt was there's, it's weird, I felt this trifecta, Mm. uh, three different things. Not not trifecta, the camp at Burning Man. Not trifecta, they're awesome, Yes, by the way. um, And feeling like, what are the elements that really fit my passion and fulfill me. Mm-hmm. And so coaching is one of them. This mm-hmm. documentary and project is one of them, which I'm going to go ahead and launch yeah. um, into another project. I'll let you know another time once that's ready to launch. Yes. <laughs> well, I will have another bottle of three buck check waiting Ooh, for that interview. Three buck check now. Yeah, they went up a dollar. Oh, fuckers. Fuckers. Grapes got expensive, I guess. Well, you know what happened in Napa? I heard about something that happened. What in happened Napa. in Napa? There's an earthquake or something like that. There's an earthquake in Napa? And I shook it up. I was in Taiwan when this happened, and people were in Taiwan and were like, oh my God. People in Taiwan know where Napa is? Yeah, they were like, oh my gosh, no Napa, earthquake. Yeah. Wine prices are going up. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah, there it goes. I guess there's a very important reason for the population of Taiwan to be aware of Napa. Um, They're big booze drinkers, actually. Get your whiskey at the airport. Oh, I Taiwan. believe whiskey, yeah. Wait, what, so, what's okay, your so, favorite? What's my favorite alcohol? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Uh, you know what? I like rum, but I tend to drink more vodka because vodka soda. Because vodka soda. Because, what's because, your favorite? Because carbs vodka. and sugar. Some noise just went. No, it was just the speakers. Okay, what um, what's your favorite vodka? Um, Seagrams actually. Really? Yeah, people are often surprised that I I am am purposely choosing Seagrams other than it was just a thing on sale. You must have Um, heard my. Really? Really? No, everybody responds that way. It's I think it's the smoothest vodka for that price range. What price is it? It's like eighteen bucks for a handle usually. And it's like uh, three times or five times distilled, three times. Oh, okay. So it's pretty, it's pretty smooth. I didn't know that. Yeah. I really love Chopin. Chopin? Chopin. Which one's that? Is I don't it, remember. But the, they have it at like CVS? I don't think so. Where do you get it? Bars. Where? And at liquor warehouses. Oh. It's some fancy schmidt. It's really nice. No. Yeah. I like it. I don't know why. I just, the flavor... The taste, the smoothness, mm. I actually prefer it over Belvedere or Grey Goose. Yeah, that stuff is super overrated. I used to work or, in the nightlife industry, right. I assure you. Grey Goose and Belvedere, it's all just good marketing. It's great marketing. Yeah. I'm just like... Mm. I mean, look, they're they're not bad. But at the price point that they're at, it's ridiculous. There are some great 
Russian vodkas. Dude, the, the Kirkland brand vodka. I don't know about the Kirkland brand. No, no, no. I know it's, a, they, people talk about it being the same barrel. Yeah. As a, I don't know uh, if this is true. I have not officially researched this. It could just be urban, urban legend. legend. Yeah. But it's fucking smooth vodka. It's fine. It's pretty smooth, but I actually get a headache from drinking Kirkland. Specifically. Specifically. Could it be that you're drinking a lot more of it because there's a lot more of it there? There's absolutely that potential. <laughs> I think that that's a factor. Of yeah, <laughs> like it kind of like this is just a so totally random, <laughs> random side note. Like people talk about like yeah, ecstasy did this to me, and I did so many pills that my brain doesn't work as well. I'm like, are you, was it the pills or was it all the other shit you did to yourself for the past ten years? Good I'm question. Good I'm just saying. Accumulative. Yeah, well, sure. I think we should do like a little vodka thing next time a vodka challenge next time yeah listen we're gonna get through half of that podcast and it's gonna all fall apart if we're doing if we're drinking the amount of vodka that we're drinking wine right now well then we need more people on this podcast yes okay sorry. we'll just have a round table of people just I getting love, smashed i love that yeah, yeah that's a great idea it's kind of like for my you magical manifester you yeah. workshop um that i've facilitated at uh utopia this year we ended up at the top of Indian Flats, mm. in the observatory, yeah, uh, which was amazing, right? It's like, mm. basically, outside, you could see the whole entire landscape. Yeah. This was the Black Rock Observatory that was at Burning Man. Yes. We had it at Utopia this year, the yes. San Diego Regional Burn. Exactly. And we had the designer, Greg Fleshman, yeah. and also I have a photo of him. Tom, mm. uh, the builder, and um, amazing other folk there. So we were all inside for the magical manifesting workshop yeah um and it really is Ooh. a workshop yes woo woo for Ooh. us to uh exchange yeah tips secrets tricks mm. what works what doesn't with one another and it was so amazing i mean i was completely sober at the time and so when i think back wow what if i cloaked everyone in like these like hoods and capes before they came in. <laughs> and that oh, wow. would have been so much fun. Yeah. If people got to dress up when they come came in and had this sit down conversation about magic. Yeah. Because essentially that was what it was. Yeah. How do we manifest magic into our lives? How do we manifest quote unquote, right? Um, do we do anything about it? Is it just a thought? Can we just wish and will it into our existence or do we, actually actively pursue it with determination and intention which mm. is essentially what we really focused on and we covered so many areas from uh, scientific to spiritual to practical it's beautiful so, so when are we going to actually see this documentary that's a really good question ballpark I, ballpark ballpark if you had to manifest a, a, a general year and date when is it going to be I really wanted to manifest it for next year. Okay. 2015. Uh, the clairvoyant that I mm -hmm. saw last month in Taiwan told me uh, 2016. <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, yeah. I'm going to go with the clairvoyance. <laughs> really? Yeah. You're going to go with the woo-woo? Yeah. Not because of the woo-woo part of it, but just because with my film production experience... I would say, yes, we would love for it to come to fruition next year, but it's probably realistically going to be another year. I think you're right, actually, with that. Um, but for the time being, people can go to the website and like get teasers and read information and stuff. Totally get teased. Yeah. Come and get teased. Go get teased. Um, because, What's uh, wrong with you? That's what we do. We tease. Yeah. I love teasing. Alice and... teases the fuck out of people. <laughs> 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 What's the website? Dreamshiftinspire.com com oh, this is good that you got that url dude thank god that's awesome i do have the dream dash dot oh, wait damn it oh the one with all the dashes with in the all middle? the dashes oh I, no i initially thought it would be yeah. great to separate them and no. it's like no 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 no, no, no. just one dream it's not 1994 Come on. yeah uh is that also where they can get a hold of you if they're interested in coaching uh actually it's a different website right now okay manifest metamorphosis that's a lot of syllables. I know it is. Okay. Uh, I have plans to uh, combine all of them under aliceswing.com mm -hmm. at some point. Oh, yeah. That's good. Um, so, but Why that's... haven't you done that yet? 
uh, I'm in the process of building that actually, in the okay. process of seeing how that's actually going to lay out between um, the coaching, the documentary, mm. this new project that's tied in with the documentary, yeah, yeah, and also music. So as I'm collaborating with, you're also creating friends, music, collaborating with friends, more dreams that are coming true. Beautiful, right? Uh, and speaking of which, positive vibes journeys what's that just creating positive oh uh, general woo -woo. music yeah. general woo -woo tracks mm. and subliminal tracks and mm. um also hopefully in the future well definitely in the future um beautiful transcendent psychedelic journeys beautiful I dig it and you're so you're gonna go see infected mushroom i am tonight. are you coming maybe how can I convince you? Buy my ticket. I'm kidding. Buy your ticket. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, we can make that I, happen. I we may, can manifest that. We're going to manifest the free ticket? We can manifest the ticket. We will discuss this after after the show. But uh, So you're going to go see Infected Mushroom. Yeah. I missed them at the burn twice. Yeah. So I'm excited. I, I, oh, God. If I made a list of all the shit that I missed at the burn because I was trying to keep myself from unraveling. <laughs> What's it? Fear of missing out? FOMO. 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 No, I'm definitely feeling FOMO. Like, the logic in me tells me that I shouldn't go, but the FOMO is like, you should go see Infected Mushroom. What do you got to lose? Uh, hours of sleep and work and uh, work. Mm. That's a really lame note to end the podcast on, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. Alice, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Raj. Okay. Pleasure. Do... Yes. This is a pl another egg clean glass. Clean. Bing. We still yeah, have contact. alcohol left. Deep eye contact and then Deep. drink. Eye gazing contact? Mm. You don't have to actually keep your eye on the person as you drink. You just need to make the eye contact afterwards. But if this was woo-woo, we would continue the eye contact. Uh, I know. If it was woo-woo, we'd like talk about like how our vibration is going to be up. Whatever. You know, let's not start on the one. We'll be here for another hour. <laughs> That'll be next time. I'm going to stop this recording. All right, well, there you have it. Third time's a charm. Well, I don't know. I mean, it was charming as hell, I guess. Uh, that's basically what that was. Uh, you can tweet me directly, at Mr. Arash. That's M-R-A-R-A-S-H. And when discussing the show, please do use the hashtag BurnerPodcast. Um, help us uh, build some momentum here, get some more listeners, and... Uh, in turn, make the show a little bit better by having more participation from all of you beautiful people. Uh, that tune you heard during the break, uh, it's the same one from Duckman. Make sure you look up Duckman on uh, SoundCloud. Uh, if you Google Duckman San Diego, that'll come up. Duckman is an amazing producer. And we love him, and thank you so much for letting me just um, rampage through your uh, music and use whatever the fuck I want uh, on the show. Uh, this episode is produced by Meg King. If you have questions or suggestions for future guests, shoot them over to Meg King. She is on Twitter at that Meg King. I was about to say .com. My God, uh, that was sad. Uh, our online editor is Alpi. She writes and curates the blog and can be reached at burnerpodcast.gmail.com. Or you could tweet her at burner underscore podcast. Make sure you remember that underscore because uh, at burner podcast was taken up by some weird rock label in Australia that I can't email by the way they don't have an email address listed you have to call them and I don't know how to use a phone um, or you can use the contact form by the way if you have any questions for any of us and don't feel like doing the whole twittery and the facey spacey stuff go to burnerpodcast.com and uh, there's a contact page there I swear to god you can just go through right there uh, the burner podcast theme song is America's Horse with No Name remix produced by Joman Check out his stuff at soundcloud.com slash DJ Joman, J-O-M-A-N. Hope you'll join us next time. We release new episodes on the first and third Wednesdays of the month at some point during the day. Um, <laughs> if you Once you complain enough, I will set a set time. But for now, it's at some point during the day. Um, which uh, I learned recently, by the way, Wednesday is, the, is named after Odin. It's pretty cool. I like that. So anyway, until next time love and light and all the other crap. Good night.